Hey everybody, hope you're doing well. Welcome to Tone Talk with Mark Uzanski and Dave Friedman. Tonight is our awesome guest. We've got uh, pro rig pioneer Bob Bradshaw. How you doing, Bob? Good. How you doing, guys? Doing awesome. Excellent. Yeah. All right. Thanks for joining, man. We've been talking sure. about having you on for a long time. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, Dave, what's going on with you? You home? You know, the world's ending, you know, but hey. <laughs> <laughs> we're not going to talk about that. Yet. No. Yeah. We're keeping I'm it. I'm going to talk down here. About stupid, geeky, cool stuff that people love. So, there you go. We're going to keep yeah. it keep it light tonight. So, uh, yeah, Bob, we want to talk all about your career. I've got tons of questions for you. Oh, um, good. And um, as a matter of fact, you know what? I'm just going to dive right in because uh, you're, li you're living in Pennsylvania now, right? You were living in I LA. I am. I'm in Lidditz, Pennsylvania. I'm in a facility called Rock Lidditz, um, which is owned by Claire Brothers and uh, Tate Towers, the uh, staging uh, people. And um, yeah, it's a, it's a great place. Um, it's an up and coming thing. Um, I'm in a facility in a building that um, houses uh, a, a bunch of different companies that cater to the live touring industry. Mm. Um, for example, tour supplies in here, they've got a place, um, rocket cargoes in here, um, other companies like Pyrotech, uh, which does all the fire for a lot of big shows, you know, um, uh, who else? Uh, Control Freak is another uh, automation systems uh, company. Um, there's uh, uh, rigor training here. There's something called CMT, I think. It's a training facility for riggers. And um, so there's that going on. Uh, there's a urgent care facility in here, a, wow. a uh, gym, a brewery. Um, a restaurant. Oh, that, that cover. It's like a whole it's, city. It's a, it's a roadie mall, man. It's crazy. It's um, it's uh, and it, it turned out to be a good place for me to move when I wanted to get out of Los Angeles. And I've been here three years now. So. And you like it? Yeah. I do quite a bit. It's a different lifestyle, of course. You know, from Los Angeles, which I was there, you know, for like um, 39 years. So you had enough so, of that. Yep, I did, and um, <laughs> yeah. So oh, I just yeah, wanted something just... different, you know. And and I'm, you know, I'm 63 now, so you know, I just wanted a different um, um, lifestyle, I guess. I don't know, you know. I drive to work, uh, passing farms and and uh, cornfields and shit. It's pretty um, uh, pretty relaxed. <laughs> I'm sort of envious. Uh, yeah. if... I had to figure out a place to go, uh, Dave. I was like, okay, I got to get out of L.A. I'm tired of this. And, you know, um, it had just gotten untenable in L.A. with the traffic and the people. And I don't know. It just had to move. So um, um, I reached out to a client of mine named Chad Taylor. He's uh, in the band Live. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, he's uh, lived here all his life. He's got a beautiful uh, recording studio complex in York, Pennsylvania, which is 30 miles away from here. And I said, I, I reached out to him and I said, you know, hey, I'm, I'm looking to move out of L.A. I don't really want to go to Nashville, can't go to New York. I'd like to be on the East Coast because I've really never lived here before. You know, I was born in Florida, went to tech school in Atlanta, and then I went to California. You know, so I wanted seasons, you know, that kind of thing. And so, um, yeah, he said, come out here. I got a place for you. There's a place called Rock Lidditz, blah, blah, blah. It's brand new. It's going up. Uh, they're looking for people to, to take spaces in here and. And they'd love to have you, I'm sure, and we'll figure it out. He said, just move here. Mm. So I uh, <laughs> loaded up the truck and <laughs> moved to uh, Lidditz, of all places. You know, like the Beverly Hills country. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's like that. Yeah, so, you know, it was, um, 
he put me up actually chad put me up at his uh studio facility i uh live there for um uh, they have uh, apartments in this facility for uh, people who come and record at the studio there and uh there are these beautiful apartments and this facility is fantastic it's like i walk out of my bedroom basically it was like a hotel room pretty much i walk out of there to this fully equipped kitchen um and a living room with um the full-on flat screen tvs and you could cook a freaking thanksgiving dinner in this kitchen it was fully <laughs> modern just beautiful i lived there for two months rent free he just put he put me up and while i got it together here and actually also while the uh space here at rock Litus was being built out when i first came mm -hmm. in here it was a gravel floor um mm. and it wasn't finished you know and so i moved in here at the same time the tone tailors guys moved in in fact i sublease my space from the tone tailors guys so this was uh -huh. like a perfect opportunity for me i didn't have to put up any money at all to get in here right it was yeah. like a, it was like perfect you know i just had to start paying rent and so right. um, yeah I'm, here i am so that's fantastic. worked out good yeah that's good that's good really? jealous <laughs> anyway <laughs> so how long you guys know each other dave you and bob oh god we've gone back since when you were working with brower right Eight? Yeah. Evan, when mm -hmm. I went to work for Brower, I did. Oh yeah, Andy. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Have you have you have you talked to him in recent years at all? I have not, but I know where you're going. <laughs> Hang on a second. His light back on. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's special. Yeah, I know. Yeah. <laughs> But you know what? Um, Andy was an innovator at the time, and Absolutely. he really was. And he came up with something that nobody else was doing, and I got to respect him for that. You know, um, he gave me my start in the business and everything. And yep, yeah, you know, and I'm still here. Yep, yeah, I get it. I don't know what happened. Um, I don't know the whole story with him, but that's for another uh, time, I guess. You know. Yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> I hear you. So Some private you, conversation. Yeah. 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 That, that makes sense. I wish him the best, though. You know. That's cool. I, know I do too. Some issues, but you know. But, uh, I, I always bring him up when, whenever, whenever the uh, conversation starts. So where did you start? And then you know that's always part of it. So. Yeah. 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 I gotta give he him. He and credit. I opened that. He and I opened that building on Weddington Street. Yeah. Now it's apartment complex. Yep. What, what was that like? Nineteen eighty-three, I think. Yeah, we you moved out of there. So that was before I came after you had moved. Just moved. I out moved of out of there pretty quick. <laughs> <laughs> just saying, I moved. You know, I moved over to Magnolia. You know, where I yeah. was there, and I stayed there for years, fifteen years or something. I don't know. Yeah, and then I was downtown for another ten years. I was downtown for exactly ten years, literally to the day. Right, it was crazy. And um, anyway, yeah, a lot of changes. Saw a lot of changes in Los Angeles way back then. Oh yeah. Well, yeah. let's let's uh, if you don't mind, because I think everybody would love to hear you know how you got into this, how you chose this career. Um, and, uh, if you could take us back, you know, were you a guitar player that got into electronics or was it the other way around or wait, yeah. and here's, here's the most important line. The most important line is when did you realize you made a mistake? <laughs> <laughs> and I couldn't, when I realized I didn't know how to do anything else. Yeah, right. <laughs> really? I, 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 I was trapped, you know, actually uh, okay, it started out basically a, as a love of music. Here I am, a kid in Florida. I loved music, but um, I didn't know anyone who was a player. I wasn't 
um, a guitar player. I tried. I mean, I bought um, a Tele Custom years and years ago when I lived with my parents. I bought a Tele Custom just to have it because I wanted an, an instrument because I wanted to get closer to it somehow, you know. Um, I had the biggest stereo on my uh, on my block uh, that you know it makes sense, I guess. Um, I would make uh, eight track tapes, you know, the eight track cartridges we had in our cars. We're talking the seventies here, you know. So um, uh, I would rec I had an eight track recorder, so I would make I would record tapes for my friends and stuff, you know. And so I, I had an interest in sound. And um, what what I really wanted, thinking I was going to get into, is to, was to be a recording engineer. I was thinking, I want to do that. I want to get into um, recording and engineering somehow, maybe live sound. Because, you know, I was a geek that went to concerts and would stand there as the roadies tore the stage down after the show, you know. And I'd stand there, geek out on the gear, not knowing what it was doing whatsoever. But I had an interest in it. So, but I didn't know anybody. I didn't know anybody. I didn't have any friends who were musicians. I was so removed from the creation of music or anything to do with music that, that I had to figure out a way to get into it somehow other than being a fan of music, whatever. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, I get, I get the little matchbook and I see DeVry Institute of Technology and my I'm I'm out of high school now for going on two years. Had a job. I was living at home with my parents. But my parents were starting to go, uh, you know, you might want to start thinking about it. If you're not going to go to college, maybe a tech school or something. Right. And I went, oh, yeah, oh, oh, oh okay. So we, we see a matchbook cover, DeVry Institute of Technology. Oops. 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 Something happened. We We're back. Are. We're back. I see you, Mark. I don't see Dave. No, I'm I'm here. Okay. I'll keep yapping. Okay. Okay. You go for there it. There you are. Hey, you, you swap places now. Now Mark's uh, on the uh, top. Yeah, Dave's you know, on some, the bottom. Some, you know, you know, here's the problem that's going on right now is all the internet stuff is being gobbled up by all the people that are home, so Oh, you know it. Uh, yeah. So, you know, we don't know what we're going to get. And I, normally I do this for my shop, but I'm sitting here at home doing it. So, uh, you know, yeah. you know, we'll yeah. see what happens. Hopefully well, we'll just keep yakking yeah. until it, we can't. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Sounds good. Okay, so, you, so, so you were saying DeVry. Yeah. So I go. Um, so I moved to I get out of school. I moved well, out of school, I, uh, out of uh, my parents' house. I go up to Atlanta, and uh, it's my first time away from home, you know, and uh, Atlanta's 10 hours away from where I grew up in Florida. And so um, I go to uh, tech school. It was a technician's tech school in Atlanta. No audio, just basic <laughs> fundamental stuff, uh, technical stuff. You learn in Ohm's Law and everything else, you know, and everything that goes with it. Blah, blah, blah. And um, I apply myself finally. I'm, I'm la my lazy ass. I applied myself and I graduated. Believe it or not, I graduated 4.0 from this technical school. Mm. And Hughes Aircraft uh, comes to the school and starts uh, and is recruiting people. I figure, OK, I'll go to uh, L.A. and I'll. Uh, I'll go out there because the music business is out there and um, I'll work for user aircraft for a year and then I'm out in LA and I'll find a way to get into it. Now, meantime, I'm reading all the time. I'm reading uh, about audio. I've got a, a subscriptions to guitar player magazine. I'm into Craig Anderton, the back of the magazine every month. That's a whole nother story here, but, um, and these recording magazines, uh, recording, uh, REP it was called, Recording Engineer Producer, which turned into Mix Magazine. Right. And um, 
I got into that. There was another one really cool called DB Magazine, mm. which was like a, a, pr a professional uh, sound contractors magazine. It was a little more technical. I had real more technical articles. I bought books, and I was just a crazy reader. That's where I got all my audio knowledge. I got the basic fundamentals of electronics through DeVry, but all of my audio stuff I'm gaining out of books. And I still have these dog-eared um, books that um, I learned from. I still have them. They're great. They're a semiconductor uh, handbook. Um, I had the uh, Radiotron book, you know, the tube book. And I had the RCA manual, of course, and um, all of that stuff. And um, that's where I learned all my uh, electronic stuff. Mm -hmm. So I worked for Hughes Aircraft. Long story short, I worked for Hughes Aircraft for a year to fulfill my obligation. I'm living in Gardena in the South Bay. And I started looking in the recycler for, um, you know, places. You know, I don't know anybody out there. You know, I mean, I don't know anybody. I, I came out there. I came out there with a girlfriend I had just met from Atlanta. We moved out there. She knew. She, she actually worked in the business somewhat. She she was uh, a electronic um, assembler and stuff. She knew assembly stuff, and she got jobs out there in um, uh, what do you call it. Um, uh, um, in the aerospace industry, assembly, doing assembly stuff in the South Bay, which is big for that, you know. I work for Hughes Aircraft in El Segundo. So um, we lived together in Gardena, and she knew people in the touring business. She knew some people in Frank Zappa's crew, and she knew some other people with sticks and stuff. It was crazy. Anyway, um, so um, I'm learning at home. I'm reading up on this, and I see an ad. And I, I get a job at a place called Musician Service Center, which was in uh, West L.A. And this is a repair shop. I never worked on uh, gear before. I never worked on any musical instrument stuff. Um, so the guy liked me. I was into it. Big time. I said, I'm a fast learner, blah, blah, blah. And he went, um, you know, he, he asked me um, the resistor color code. I pulled that off easy. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> I knew Ohm's law. <laughs> you know, I could get through that. So I guess I had a job. So he gives me a job. And now I'm in somewhat a music business, right? So I'm working on Marshall amps. I'm getting the shit shocked out of me. I'm just <laughs> work by man, work by doing. I worked on REO Speedwagons, uh, Rick, Gary Richrath's uh, Marshalls, um, and um, a bunch of other stuff. We did these crazy mods uh, on like Fender Twins that they called channels in series, mm -hmm. where you would take the normal channel and you'd put it in series with a, a vibrato channel, and and crank the fuck up out of the uh, the first channel and dial back the gain on the, the second channel. There's no master volumes on them. Right, right, right. <laughs> and it made it a, 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 a dirty, distorted sound. And a guy showed me how to do a master volume across the um, uh, the grids of the power tubes. It was a weird master volume type thing you mm -hmm. could do um, that was interesting. And um, we would do those kind of mods. And so there was a guy in the back, named Tim, get his name, Tim something or other. He ended up working for Eric Clapton, I think. He was a keyboard guy. And he was trying to come up with a pedal board idea. And I'm like, what is this, you know? So, uh, and sometimes he would get in Paul Rivera's boards. You know, that, that a guy yeah. would, um, Paul, Paul was still doing that stuff at first. Um, and so I would see Paul Rivera's boards and I would see how he would modify the pedals and he would put LEDs in them and he'd put little DIN connectors on them to supply power. 
And so he modified the pedals, you know, MXR pedals and stuff didn't have lights at the time. Right. You know? Did he do any other so, mods to them at all? Or it was just really just. Yeah, he did. He did buffer things. and mm -hmm. Yeah, the old uh, CE1 chorus, Paul Rivera. Yeah, the, car the chorus thing. That was pretty cool. Yeah, I worked on so many of those things. Wow. Yeah, always good. And um, I would rack mount them, you know, and put a buffer I, in them because I they're. Remember. Yeah, well, a lot of those. Did that for Buzzy Feetin'. And um, anyway, um, we'll do some of those. Uh, but, but 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 this is we're getting ahead of myself a little bit there. So here's this guy Tim. What the heck was his name? I forget. Anyway, um, he wanted to do a pedal board. He'd take this uh, 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 this strip, this aluminum strip that you put on floors or door jam type stuff, and he'd mm -hmm. drill foot switches into them so he'd have this little strip of foot switches and he was trying to do stuff and i was looking at that going and this doesn't seem too cool but i wasn't telling him that because he was kind of a prick so <laughs> <laughs> I can't, he, he was a, not a nice guy but um but i saw those things and he was working on keyboards and blah 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 but at the while this is going on i'm immersing myself there was one guy there that was nice who did keyboard stuff. He was the brainiac of the place, and he was a nice guy. He worked all on all the old uh, Prophet Fives and the CS80s that would come in, the uh, Yamaha CS80 keyboards and shit. And he was nice, and he hit me to stuff. But there, the big thing for me was the back of uh, Guitar Player magazine there was a, um, a series of articles by Craig Anderton. I still have these to this day. I'm going to put them up and frame them someday. There's three of them. And it was, it, he described a concept, with merely a concept of remote switching and, and the idea of instead of having a bunch of pedals on a pedal board and such, why not, you know, put them in? He called them switching stations. And you could put them into what they well, we call them loops now. But, you know, um, these stations that uh, would route signals to and from pedals. And I thought, oh, that seems kind of cool. So I started futzing around with that. The parts that he was using, I didn't like. They were, they were real dirty and they were called an analog switch. Uh, I don't know if you've seen these, Dave. They're called a 4016. It was an old... Um, yeah, 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 sure. That, um, what, 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 was, what was the first IC you used in the switchers? Um, I went through several different um, configurations. I started out with discrete FETs. I built a, a loop out of dis discrete um, FETs. And it took four of them. Yeah, yeah but then, but then and later you had to buffer was... the crap out of them because you know the impedance was low and it was weird. So um, that was that was the first. The first one was discrete. Second one, um, I had a oh. guy. I, I, I had moved on from Musician Service Center. I got the the bug there, but I moved on from Musician Service Center. I worked there for maybe six to eight months, maybe a year. In the meantime, at home at night, and I'm thinking about this stuff, you know, and I'm working on stuff. And I'm working on a couple of guys, little pedal boards around town, local musicians. This is the punk was huge then, man. Punk was coming. You know, it was like this is like 19, this is 78. I moved out there. 79, I'm working for Hughes. 80, I'm at home. I'm coming up with shit. I, I, I work, work for Hughes for a year. Then I went to work. I'm trying to get the timeline together. And, and then I worked for Musician Service Center. And that's when it really hit because now I'm working with musical stuff. So, yeah. And I'm coming up with shit at home. I got a little breadboard thingy and I'm working on different circuits. And I am inspired by Craig Anderton's articles. I start working on an idea. That I'm thinking. I'm thinking, shit, why can't I build a box that the pedals plug into? It's just like the same shit I'm doing today. 
You know, it's yeah. like it's the same thing. Well, how can I <coughs> get all these pedals to work together and have a box on the floor with, you know, lights? Because I'm seeing guys with pedal boards and literally this is all this isn't rack mount or anything at this time. You know, I'm doing this shit. I have diagrams that I drew up that are based very similar to pedal board based systems that everybody's doing these days back in 1980. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I had my own version of that and, and it consisted of a patch box and a foot switch, you know, so it was already, they were already separated, you know, yeah. now they were right next to each other, sort of, but all you got to do is extend it with a longer cable, blah, blah, blah. So, um, I'm working on this and I'm not, I'm not, I'm just doing it for myself. I don't have anybody that I'm doing it for. And my girlfriend and I uh, go to see one of my favorite guitar players in the world at the time, and still to this day, is Buzzy Feeton. And I love mm -hmm. Buzzy to death. He'll drive you crazy. He's a, he's a seeker. He's into making things better. He's a tinker himself, as clearly, mm -hmm. you know, with all the stuff, you know, he's done. And um, we go and go see him play. Now, at the time, there were these uh, clubs in, um, in Redondo Beach. One was called the Fleetwood. Uh, one of them was, uh, was another one. Uh, there was the Lighthouse. That was the jazz club in Manhattan Beach, you know, mm. and the Fleetwood. And there was a couple of others. I can't remember the names of them, but I would go see the Larson Feeton band. It was a, a band with uh, Buzzy Feeton and Neil Larson, who were legends in my book, man. I loved them to death. And I love Buzzy and Neil. They've been playing as a duo for years, even back in Florida when I was living, when I grew up in Florida. They were known back there in the Sarasota area. They were friends with the Allman Brothers and Greg Allman and such. And, and um, um, they uh, were now out in California and doing the thing. Anyway, I meet Buzzy. Uh, we, we go to this show and I see Buzzy with this crazy ass pedal board, all the pedals all over it, you know, all kinds of stuff. Uh, MXR. Uh, 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 some boss pedals, boss C1, um, some other stuff, and an Echoplex mounted on a mic stand <laughs> up off the ground so that he could reach the slider, you know, awesome. without bending over. But right. he still had to bend over for all the other shit on the floor. <laughs> and he was always tinkering, man. He was always fucking around with shit. And I was like, God, man, it's distracting. <laughs> <laughs> takes away from the music, you know, and, and watching that takes away from from the, a show there. You know, you're, you're watching him. You, you're seeing him fucking struggling with his shit. <laughs> so I go, man, this guy would be perfect for this idea. And I was too nervous to, to go meet him. So my girlfriend at a set break, she goes, I'll go back. I'll meet him for I'll tell him who you are. And she went backstage. And she was really cute and uh just beautiful and she went back um introduced herself and they took notice <laughs> and she said my boyfriend wants to talk to you because he's got an idea for something that he can help you with your gear blah 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 and she comes back out to me i'm sitting at the table and she goes buzzy wants to meet you come on let's go I'm like, what, what, what are you talking about? I'm freaking out now. I'm going to meet my hero, man. I mean, this guy was, I was, in, I just love this guy. I go back and I meet him and, and I sputter through my spiel, man. I'm like, yeah, man, uh, um, I got an idea for a way to connect all your pedals. And then you could have them up off the ground and you just have a foot switch and the foot switch would have LEDs. So you'd know when stuff is on and you'd have an individual switch and an LED for each th th shit I'm doing today, you know? So um, he, he, he was up for it. He goes, that sounds interesting. 
let's do it. So that's, we struck up a, a friendship and a, um, and a working relationship um, that was fantastic for me. He gave me carte blanche. He let me do whatever I wanted to do um, in terms of uh, 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 improving or whatever I wanted to do if I thought I had something um, interesting um, or a way to make it better. He was all for it. Mm-hmm. He just, he let me go. He let me go with it. And I was like thrilled. I got a guy, I got a guinea pig, you know, a great player, a great player who I love and respect. who was a monster player. I'm like, fuck, this is amazing. This and, he's pay- and he's paying you to do this. Yes. Right. Yes. <laughs> yeah. I got a little money up front. I right. mean, not enough, <laughs> <laughs> right. not enough, but you know, it's like I was young, you know, I was probably 20. Maybe something like that, you know. Oh, yeah. And and just full of fire, man. You know. So uh, I start working on this thing, and I, and he gave me a uh, some dough to start, and I start working on it, and um, you know, th- that's kind of how it got started. You know, it just um, he let me do my thing. Um, uh, first thing you know, um, uh. Uh, here, the thing. This is the thing about what it is I was doing. I was at the right place at the right time, mm-hmm. and I sensed a need for this. It's what it's simple as that. Mm-hmm. I was in Los Angeles, studio capital of the world, man. I mean, there was like studios everywhere, all kinds of things going on there. And and music was breaking at that point. Yeah, it was unbelievable. Oh, yeah. Technology yeah. was like taking off right this is pre midi midi wasn't hadn't even been invented yet right. you know this is way before midi yeah. this is a couple of years before midi came out in 83 um yeah. Oh, like that, yeah way before midi i start doing this thing and it's at, at an individual switch i got a gutter uh, a, a, a manufacturer of uh gutters to bend the metal for my foot switch boxes I got them to, you know, fabricate this, these boxes for me. And I, uh, figured out the, the, um, angle of the foot switch box by putting my, both my feet on the ground and then just moving my foot up and saw where my foot went. And I went, Oh, okay. There it is. (laughs) There it is. As you raise your foot off the ground, you know, your, your toe goes, little higher and i used that angle i thought okay and that's about three and a half inches at the high side and about an inch at the low side and um that's the way it is to this day mm-hmm. you know but anyway um i started doing this and there weren't any presets or anything so i'm going i'm thinking fuck this is cool you've got an individual switch for everything um great and you've got lights now um i didn't want to modify the pedals i wanted you to be able to plug in and interchange pedals i didn't want it to be locked into that system paul rivera's stuff was kind of locked in right now the other thing about this too it's like paul was now getting out of building pedal boards he was doing amps he had done the little the yamaha g112s for yamaha and he went to work for Fender, you know, and he started doing all that Fender stuff. He had moved uh-huh. on. He wasn't doing that. So this, there again, right place at the right time. There's a hole right there. So I start getting guys who were going to Paul Rivera. And um, it's all word of mouth. And, and I'm, in a, I'm in, in a studio. Okay, it's studio world. It's studio town, I should say. So there's all these guys that have pedal boards, you know, um, it's not even the rock guys or anything yet. It's mainly studio players. So Landau. I get Buzzy Feet. Now I got Buzzy Feet. Uh, Buzzy goes and he do, does dates. Other guys on the dates see this contraption, this thing that we're doing. Now what I ended up having to do was, okay, we, we're going to put stuff up off the floor but so what do you do that with you know um oh something called a rack okay um 
Buzzy and I, we got a Techniques stereo component rack. You know, those kind of things that you put your stereo components in? Yeah, I remember You know, those. in yep. your house with it like a glass front, yep. you know? You, we removed the glass. The, the, yeah. the, there weren't rack ears in there. We, I had to put the rack ears in. I made a top um, that's um, that had a cutout for the Echoplex. So the Echoplex is at the very top. It's like a it's like a mixer top style mm -hmm. setup, you know, where you, you see racks nowadays that have mixer tops, you know. Um, yeah. But but this ha had a um, uh, a flat aluminum panel on the top with uh, a cutout for an Echoplex, a cutout for a a, a MXR uh, a Dynacomp, um, a, a cutout for a Boss EQ, a graphic EQ, and I don't know what else. There wasn't any room for the Boss Chorus, so I rack mounted it. Mm -hmm. That's where that started. Okay, I'll rack mount this thing because there's no room now on the top for the for for the chorus or a couple of room. Those are actually on the only damn T-shirts that I've made, other than my cat T-shirt, but was ones with Buzzy's original rig on it. Still have them. <laughs> well, that's cool. So, um, anyway, right. Um, that's where all that started. So, Buzzy. So now it's like, okay, I'm doing this thing for Buzzy. Buzzy goes off and he goes on tour with Larson Feet and Band. I'm staying home. They, uh, his managers at the time thought I was too green to go out on tour. So uh, I can't do that. So they get a, um, a guy, a, a great uh, guy named Barry Owen, who uh, was the um, road guy for him. Now, Barry was a um, amazing guy, but he wasn't super technical. So he relied on me heavily to um, maintain things. And if he had a problem, he'd get with me. So I supported him from home when he's out touring with this thing. Um, and at that time I'm going, okay, well, how cool would it be if you could hit one button and have multiple things happen, more than one thing come on at a time? That would be cool. So I start working on that. And I start coming up with a, um, an idea using these little memory chips. And it, this is all, I'm telling you, this is all discrete. These are all discrete flip-flops. Um, little pulse generators and little counters and think this is not a microprocessor thing. This is all uh, discrete, um, not discrete. They're ICs, they're IC chips, but um, just flip-flops and stuff. So I come up with a plan for presets where you still have the direct access switch and you got a preset switch now too. So a preset, you can set a combination of the direct access switches and select a preset, select a combination, hit a store button, and it stored it in that spot. Mm -hmm. Just like I'm doing today still. Mm -hmm. It's right. the same shit, you know? And, and everybody the else is selling it. same thing. And, and everybody's selling that. Yeah, exactly. So that's why all my boards were so big at the time, because I wouldn't get away from the direct access approach to the stuff. We're talking individual switches for everything right. you need to control. You got those instant access all the time. I call it direct access. Everybody else calls it instant access. I call it direct access. Mm -hmm. It's my term, damn it. Anyway, <laughs> so, so, um, hey man, you're, but you're you with the originator, so you can show it. Yeah. Yeah, this, you can call uh, it whatever you want. Whatever. <laughs> now, here's the dumbest thing I never, I, I ever did or didn't do. I didn't patent it. So there was no, you know, um, there was no way to hold on to a lot of this stuff. Um, was it patentable? And, Is that something like that? Um, I wasn't sure that it was. And uh, because I got I got little bits of these these little circuits I would get out of these books that I had that would show, uh, you know, so I can't steal that pulse generator, can I? It's in a book, hmm. but it's like, I was just stupid. I didn't know any better. I didn't know that you could 
patent the concept. You know, that whole thing could have. Right. You know, didn't. Dumb. Didn't know any patent attorneys. You know, like I just like I didn't know any musicians. You know, I'm doing it all on my own. There's no internet. You know. Yeah. There's no way to learn. You know, other than magazines and books and whatever else Trial I can get by my fire. hands on. Magazines mostly because they're periodicals. You know. But you know these books. Anyway, okay. Make a long story sh even longer. Um, <laughs> no, take your time. That's. Um, where I came up with this idea. Okay, I'll go to Buzzy. Buzzy, check this out. Presets. Wow, that's awesome. Cool. Now you can preset combinations of things. Now I got presets still years away from MIDI, years away from microprocessor stuff. These are all discrete circuits. It's, uh, or I should say just static logic circuits is what I should say. Um, and so meanwhile, I'm working on my um, audio routing at the same time I'm working on my control aspect of it, you know. So to get back to what you were saying, asking Dave, my audio routing things, I met a guy, oh, I'm sorry. Um, I left Musician Service Center and I went to work for a, a console company called Quad 8. I remember and Quad 8 um, built film scoring consoles. Mm -hmm. And um, so I went there, I worked for them as like a bench technician. And I worked on a project called, um, what was it called? System One, which we dubbed System No Fun because it was like a <laughs> digital reverb. <laughs> it was a digital reverb along the lines of the, um, the, the Lexicon 480s and stuff, mm -hmm. you know, the, those big, um, uh, uh, they were like multi-rack space. Uh, reverbs, yeah. Yeah, reverbs, huge. Yeah. With the, they had the remotes, you know, the cool uh, remotes and everything. Well, we had our own version of that, and it was an ongoing project. So I was working in there with an engineer, and I was like his, you know, technician. So um, this guy, Bruce Andrews, he goes, he, Bruce Andrews is a guitar player. He goes, here, check out this part. Check this thing out. It's called an LF13333. It's a, uh, a FET IC, a switch that you could configure as a double pole, double throw switch. Mm -hmm. And it was logic controlled. It made things so much easier. And it was, it was like it saved me. It was like, holy crap, this is super cool. It had good wide bandwidth it was like a wide dynamic range um the only problem was you had to load the shit out of it or else the switches would pop mm. and they would pop pretty loud there would be a click so you had to all the way around you had to tie those 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 switches down with like uh 1k or less resistors that means you had to buffer all the way around it so there was an input buffer, there was a send buffer, a return buffer, and an output buffer. A lot all of the way around this thing, active circuitry out the butt in this thing. Now remember, now everything was still, everything was pedals, but and it was all still front end too. That we weren't going into. There wasn't anything such thing as an effects loop or anything that came. Mm -hmm. That whole concept came a little later down the line. So um, so you've got a lot of active circuitry in the single pad. But the single pad wasn't that long at, at, at this point in time because there wasn't that many effects out there. I mean, it, w it wasn't crazy like it is today. You know? Yeah, mostly. So, yeah, yeah, you had a distortion oh. box, you had a compressor, you had an EQ, and you had... I don't know, an echo or something and, you know, a chorus, you know, right. things like that. So, and we, and we, we weren't as hyper sensitive to the front end as people are today, you know, where it's got to be pure and it's got to be, you know, true bypass and all this other horse shit. You know? <laughs> it's like, God, <laughs> yeah. So, um, 
I, I go, okay. Um, so I start using this, this, um, this chip and I design a circuit board to, uh, work with this chip. And so I had these cards made with a circuit board that I designed and, um, I was still designing the boards in with tape, you know, with, um, with a mylar and this circuit board tape stuff. And you had these little round little donuts that you put down and then this black tape. And then you would use that to get a, um, a, a, a negative made and then you could get it produced as a circuit board, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> and um, so that I was still designing that way. And um, so, um, that's how all my, all my circuit boards was. And they came in, in, uh, loops, uh, four loops per card. And they were freaking this big too. They were yeah, huge. Remember. remember those? Yeah. And they had uh, edge, p- edge connectors, right? The edge connectors, they would plug in. So they're somewhat modular. It was kind of cool. You could wire the box and then plug in this circuit board. And, um, so I had those for, for years and some systems had four of those in them so that had 16 loops another one said eight loops in them and a single rack space and the other ones were two rack space but they were all multi-pin connectors so there were like at the end there was as much as 24 pin connectors and i um, sure, um yeah i'd go to you apex. know out to apex you know and get to get the round circular the metal, the green ones, remember those? Yeah, the big ones. And then, then so they got a little more sophisticated and smaller, and I found these ones that were silver and blah, blah, blah. And, um, anyway, um, so they were, so I, there, there, that's what it is. There's a line and a snake for everything that you wanted to control that went to a foot switch on the board. And so that's the way it went. And um, so... so so when did you hook up with guys like Landau and, and Luke? Here's Patrick? what's coming. Okay. Here's, I'm getting there. <laughs> right. Okay. Um, I'm doing this stuff for Buzzy. Buzzy comes to me and he goes, I'm going on the road with Olivia Newton-John this summer. I want you to go with me because I want to take my gear and I want you to maintain it. Mm. Uh, okay. Uh okay, you're going to have to help me get that job. And he goes, yeah, I'll get it. You're in. You're in, dude. Now, um, also, there's another guitar player. And um, there's another, uh, and there's a bass player you have to take care of, too, Pops Popwell. And I'm, Pops Popwell, are you kidding me? He was like the bass player for the Crusaders, Jazz Crusaders. Fuck yeah, man. That sounds great. So this other guy, his name's Mike Landau. I go, Who's that? Uh, he's a young kid. He's doing sessions. He's a great guitar player, blah, blah, blah. You have to meet him. So um, I go to a Tom Scott date that Buzzy was on at Ocean Way, and here's this guy, Mike Landau. And this is before the tour. And um, uh, I meet Mike, and we hit it off big time. And um, we become fast friends. He go, We go on the we do this tour of Olivia Newton John that summer. Side note, they go, um, okay, we're doing, produ- we're not doing production rehearsals in Los Angeles. We're doing production rehearsals at the, um, where the stage is being built, where the sound company is and the stage is being built. Where do you think that was? Australia? Lidditz, Pennsylvania. Oh. Where I am now. <laughs> Uh, so okay. in 1982, oh, they fly me to Lidditz, Pennsylvania. Now, I'm telling you, man, this is 82. This place is just Amishville, man. This is like mm. buggies and, uh, you know, cornfields. And and a little place called Lidditz, Pennsylvania, where Claire Brothers and Tate Towers have their facilities stuff. Right. It was in a Quonset hut. And so I got, it was in the middle of summer. I get there, I take a flight to, I don't know if I went to Philly or Harrisburg. I don't know where I went. And then I took a puddle jumper into town. I'm like, where the fuck 
am I? You know? <laughs> anyway, so so that's where we do our, our rehearsals. I, I get the job. Um, they, 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 I'm hired by the musos, so the production guys are a little wary of me because they don't know what I'm like. You know, normally in a production, the, the you know the production managers and or stage managers or production managers hire the crew. Yeah. But I'm I actually by me coming in, another guy gets fired. Oh. So that was kind of fun. That doesn't look good for the for uncomfortable. For for, yeah, right. I'm like, I don't know. What the fuck? But I proved myself worthy. I was a nice guy. I, you know, got along with everybody. I maintained my end of the... I had three guys. This is my first tour ever. Mm -hmm. I'm dealing with three guys. That's a lot. On that tour. And um, I did it. You know, I kicked ass, man. And, I, and it worked out. We do this tour. I get to know Mike. We're now while we're on this tour, we're plotting what he's gonna want. Mm -hmm. And so I'm thinking, okay, now I'm working with Mike. Buzzy's doing his thing. Buzzy says, um, we finish this tour, and we uh, go, okay. Um, uh, Buzzy goes, I got an offer to go out with Bette Midler um, on her detour. And because um, uh, he had just played on a record and blah, blah, blah. And so it's a tour up and down the uh, west coast of uh, United States. So it's up into Vancouver and down for a month. And I want you to go. I want you to take care of my gear. OK, that's uh, this touring thing was fun. Uh, OK, it's pretty cool. Making good money for a change at the time, you know, it was pretty good. Right. Um, so I go out and I do this run with with um, with Buzzy again. This time it's just him I had to deal with and maybe the bass player. I forget even who it was. Um, uh, we come back down. It was like the end of the year. We come back down a week in San Francisco. You know, dates up in the up in the um, Portland, Seattle, Vancouver, and then down to. Um, uh, uh, Universal Amphitheater for the New Year's. Then we have a break. Now, in the meantime, Mike, I'm working on Mike's gear. We're building Mike's, I'm building Mike's system in the meantime, you know, when, I'm, when I've got time. He goes, I'm going uh, on the road next year <laughs> with uh, Joni Mitchell. I want you to go with me and take care of my gear. Mm. I'm like, Holy fucking shit. I love Joni Mitchell. It's a world tour. Right. We're we're on a break from bet and I go to I have to go I go I, I'm doing this thing with Buzzy right now. I don't know if I can do that, but I go, I gotta do this. This is eight months worth of work. This is a world tour. I've never been anywhere in my life. This was Japan, Australia, um, uh, states, Europe. Mm -hmm. It was like a, a great opportunity. I'd be taking care of Landau and Larry Klein, her her <laughs> new husband. Yeah. Who um, uh, I was now I'm getting to build a rig for as well. So I'm gonna have two rigs on this tour. Yeah. And I'm like, so I go to Buzzy. I go, look, man, I gotta t tell you, I got. Um, I actually I I went to Buzzy first, got his blessing. He said, yeah, you got to do it, man. Then I had to go to the production manager and go, um, I got an opportunity here. I got to I got to go do this. And his name was Leo Rossi. He was a super cool guy. Uh, he goes, um, hey, man, you got to do it. You're going to be working with Richard Fernandez. And you, you, you work with the Fernandez brothers. You got to go on. There's, there's Charlie Fernandez and Richard Fernandez. And uh, you got to do it. Richard was actually out on um, um, uh, uh, Olivia's tour as well. So I knew them. So it was kind of cool. So um, anyway, now I'm getting this rig together for Landau to do this world tour, Johnny Mitchell. And it was a great time. We were learning. I, 
I came up with more um, ideas and innovations and stuff with Mike Landau than anybody else I've, I think I've ever worked with. Mm-hmm. We came up with stuff that's ubiquitous today. You know, amp selecting things, the whole slaving the amp and using it as a preamp and using power amps for for uh, power to push the speakers. We came up with all that stuff. And um, I would work on, I remember we would do, on Joni's tour, we'd do multiple nights in some places. And I was tweaking all the time this gear, man. I was constantly tweaking stuff. I would, I figured out like, one time. <laughs> is that your cat? Sorry. My cat is. Is that like, a cat? Awesome. Yeah. Where is he? Let, bring him in. Let's see him. Come here. Come here. <laughs> I'm like, what is that? I'm like, last year, last show we had yeah. popping. Yeah. Yeah, cute. look oh, at him. Nice. This is my yeah. old girl. Oh, he's a beauty. She's like, uh, she's like 18 now. Wow. Oh, so she. Okay. Yeah. Is she's she? just, she has this little like, uh, um, catnip fish thing that is like yeah. on the floor. And she walks around it's like her baby and she starts meowing like crazy. <laughs> Which is what she was interrupting us with. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But hey, I've got cat. two orange tabbies, man. I'm yeah, you got your little way. guys, right? Yeah. yeah. You're two of them, right? Yep. Yeah. 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 So, um, anyway, so I was we would do it we'd be in a in a place where we'd have two nights in one venue so we didn't have to tear down that night so i'd find something i wanted to do watching shows that's the coolest that's the thing i'm learning how my gear works and responds in a real world application right i'm watching it happen and um and learning as i go what i what needs it needs to be, to be roadworthy um, among all kinds of other things. So it's this stuff is born out of not a laboratory, but the road, you know. So um, um, I would find things. I'd rip that rack mount switcher thing out of the rack, take it back to my hotel room at night. We, it was Remember, this is the 80s and stuff, too. So there would be some serious partying going on. <laughs> Mike, Mike and Vinnie Cagliuta would come to my room and they we'd be hanging out listening to music. I'd be in there with a soldering iron working on this shit. Some, with some lines next to you. Oh, yeah. Oh, of course. Yeah. So um, there was all kinds of inspiration going on there. So, um, yeah, that was going on. And um, so what I'm getting at is it was word of mouth. It was all word of mouth. From that, I was starting to, uh, when Landau's thing hit the studios with uh, Buzzies in there, then Mike's, I, people started seeing it. I started getting all the studio guys. Then, of course, I meet Andy. Andy's doing all this, a lot of studio guys, too. They see this gear when they come to deal with their gear at Andy's place, you know, because it was my place too, you know, we shared the, the building. And um, word of mouth, and it just kind of took off, you know. So, uh, um, Dean Parks comes along, and um, he's got his ideas about how he wants everything to work. So, um, I acquiesced to what he wants to do, man. I, I was, it was custom, after all. Um, I do whatever Dean wanted. I talked to him all on the phone for hours on the phone about how things are going to work and blah, 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 and this and that and the other. Um, Paul Jackson Jr. hears about it. PJ comes in. He's got the, he's got to have the biggest freaking rig at the time, a double wide flag rack with tons of shit in it, big drawers with pedals. That's the other thing. It wasn't it, when I started. It was pedals mostly. There wasn't any rack mount pieces, you know. There's, um, you know, an even tied harmonizer comes along. But here's the, the the beauty of this was, I'm in a studio and 
I, I'm seeing guys coming out of studios. They're seeing gear that gets used in the studio. They want it in their guitar rigs. So now I have to start interfacing studio gear, like even tied H910 harmonizers and weird compressors and stuff. I mean, even tied harmonizers didn't even have quarter inch jacks on them. Mm-hmm. You know, they had terminal strips on the back. Mm. So, and the biggest thing was they were meant to be used in a mix bus. They, they were 100% wet. There was no way you could get a dry uh, blend or, or make it work properly without having what I call the harmonizer interface. So I created a mix circuit. First, I had to buffer the signal because of input impedance of a, a harmonizer is super low. And I'm dealing with, you know, guitar impedance stuff, um, higher impedance. Um, I had to buffer it, and then I had to create a mix circuit so that you could blend the harmonizer sound to get that detune sound, you know. So that's in there. Then uh, Roland comes along with those SDD uh, 2000s, they were called. Now they're more guitar-oriented. At least they have quarter-inch jacks on them. They've got a blend control, you know. So those are put in there, and they're put in there in line. Then other things start coming around, you know, over over time. You know, other devices start coming along. Still, there wasn't a line mixer in sight. You know, that wasn't for the longest time before I needed to deal with line mixers because stuff was coming out that was one in, two out. And how do you maintain stereo, you know, when there's in, in, in stuff in series when there's only one input following something that's stereo out? You know, it's like, what are you going to do? Line mixer. So that's where a line mixer comes in. Yeah. Rain originally. Rains, yep. Rain SM26. Yeah, and lots of them. They were minimum, <laughs> what were they, six channels? Six yeah. channels, yeah, yeah. Yeah, six, six channels, and but they had a stereo bus at the end too, so you could cheat, have eight. Yeah, <laughs> another one. Yeah, seven. Yeah. yeah, seven. But then you still had the master volume at the output, so that was cool. So, you know, th- there, there were those. Some others came along. Um, that uh, what was it? That Passac thing came along for a while. Unity. Yeah, the Passac, and yeah. then such yeah. other one. I think Roland had one or something. Maybe Audio Arts maybe had something. I don't know. Oh, yeah, the Roland M, M. Wait, M120 or something. Roland that was. Yeah. The, that, yep. that one worked pretty well for a while. Uh-huh. Yeah. Uh huh. Yeah. Passac. Yeah. Uh, uh. Then of course, then you did the Unity Gain some amp. Yeah. Of, yeah, I went, okay, when it got a little I more- want a simple mixer. I don't want, I don't need all those controls. I want, we ended up realizing that the SM26 colored the sound too much. Now we're getting more critical about, you know, input versus output, whether it's getting fucked with. And my, my motto has always been do no harm, you know, as much as possible. You know, mm-hmm. so um, that's uh, I go, OK, I need a mixer. I need a lot more channels than an SM26. I want two mixes in one box because I want ser- a series parallel type configuration because I'm going to have it. It's just going to be a line mixer. It's not going to have sends, you know, yeah. you're not going to have any much interaction. I want to keep it simple. So I come up with a 20 channel line mixer with two knobs on it, <laughs> you know, yeah, it was stereo great. knobs. And it works, you know, I still use that circuit today, man. I use it, yeah. it's a different form now, slightly different form. It doesn't need nine volts AC anymore. It, you know, you can do it DC, but with, with conversion so that it's got plus minus 15 volts and that's all good. Yeah. Yeah. But anyway, you know, um, there's that that came along, you know. Um, I got a question. And then, oh, right? so what I was saying was it was okay. uh, word of mouth. Then I get all these guys start showing up. One day, Mike goes. One of my best friends I grew up with is a guy named Steve Lukather. Now, norm in my my career, it, it's been little milestones, you know. 
of different people. Mm-hmm. I consider Buzzy Feeton, you know, pretty much my sort of my ground zero. All I had done a bit of stuff prior to him, I call him sort of my, my professional ground zero. And the other thing I got to say is I've been very, very fortunate in this business to pretty much start out working strictly with professionals. It's always been pro guys. We have a, luckily, you know this, Dave, we're in this, you know, we started in that, the town, Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. It's a, you know, it's a music world there, man. I mean, it's like, a um, lot of great players, a lot of, a lot of great players and people, you know, flock to Los Angeles for that. Yeah, I know there's Nashville. I know there's New York, yeah. Atlanta to some extent. I know there's Texas. I know all that, but fuck it. I was in LA, you know, yeah, that's sure. where I was. That's where I made my bones, you know? Well, that's why I moved there in the first place. Yeah. 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 At I'm that sure. time. At the time, Nashville wasn't what it was. Yeah. You know, um, so not what it is today. So oh. anyway, um, he goes, you got to meet my friend Steve Lukather. And I'm going, holy, sh- yeah, I do. <laughs> you know, he'd be great. <laughs> he, he was like the top cat at the time, yeah. studio wise, man. I mean, Larry was already kind of getting out of it. Dean Parks was doing a lot of work, but he was also doing movies and stuff. A lot of and, TV. Yeah, a lot of TV work and stuff. But for dates, for doing dates, um, record dates, um, Tim came along. You know, Tim Pierce was um, came along. And I did stuff for Tim real early on um, in Santa Monica, my first place I started doing stuff. Um um, I did stuff for Tim way early on. Uh, Carl Verheyen showed up. Um, did he stuff does. for him early on in, from out of Santa Monica. And I did all my stuff, Mike, Luke. Um, so I get a, now I get a call from this guy named Dick Gall. Dick Gall was Luke's guy. Now, Luke was one of the few guys, this is kind of like, before Brower, really, it was like, I don't know, this is 83, 84. And he's really just getting started there. With yeah. his, he had a personalized service that he offered where right. he took care of um, studio guys gear, did the cartage. But also, he maintained the instruments and did a lot of um, what you could call value added. So, uh, had a service. Yeah, you know, man, you know, one thing I learned from him was service and cater to your client and and respect your client and just he had a, a very um, distinct in his head what he wanted to achieve yeah. with. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And and I, I think that was a valuable lesson for me. Yeah. I think all of that, that's something that, like I said, he, he he kind of came up with, he was an innovator for that kind of thing in that, in that world for the time, you know? Uh, so I got to give him credit for that for sure. Um, so anyway, where was I? Um, you got to meet Luke. So, okay. Um, I get, anyway, I get a call from Dick Gall, right? Lukather, Steve Lukather was one of the few studio guys in town at the time that I knew of that had his own personal guy that went to every date he did, set up his gear, maintained it for, or sort of maintained it for him, um, and um, took care of him. Um, With all due due respect to Steve Lukather, um, he was not the most, he's a, a world-class monster, mother, uh, uh, amazing musician, amazing. Mm-hmm. He can do anything he practically puts his mind to. I don't think there's anything he can't play in any genre, literally. Oh, where he's you amazing, go. unbelievable, but he's not terribly technical. 
<laughs> and if there was something wrong with his gear or something that wasn't right to him, he was prone to flipping out. <laughs> and, <laughs> Listen, and, I have seen this first fucking hand. <laughs> God bless him. He's a, um, he didn't, yeah, I know, you, I'm sure you have. Like all kinds of ways, man. Um, much to um, Andy Brower's chagrin. <laughs> well, well, let me. And let me you, you probably had to set his gear up a lot of times too, right? I when did when I was 18 years old. When I first moved here, you know, like yeah. that—that's what we were doing. We were doing yeah. cartridge, and we were doing you shit. You were setting and, up my rigs. I was a baby. Right? Yeah, I was a baby kid, you know. And I was setting up and, and, you know, like when you tell your story of how you were um, driven to learn and read the magazines and learn yep. everything there yep. was, well, that parallels me. I would just later. Uh-huh. Right. It, it parallels me in the same way. Right. It just like I had this thing. You had a, you had a, you had a willingness to learn and an insatiable need to do it. Yeah. Insatiable need. And nothing was going to yeah. stop. Me, you know, it's just right. like. It's like, I'm going to keep going. Go, go, go. But, um, but yeah, I remember setting up his rig. First of all, generally speaking, he didn't know barely where to plug the guitar in. Right. <laughs> yeah. No, no, right there, dude. <laughs> <laughs> no, that <Yeah>. happened. <laughs> okay, so. so. <laughs> but, but wait, but wait. I don't want to, yeah, I just tell your story. specific time, and it really wasn't a problem, but, um there was one specific time. I don't remember what session it was. We were at a studio and he goes, ah, let's wind Andy up. Uh-oh, uh-oh, <laughs> which he loved to do. So, so he called him on the phone. Nothing was wrong. Yeah. He called him on the phone and like <laughs> just started reaming him. <laughs> And we're all just sitting there fucking laughing. And and he's just, you know, he's just and, flustered. And back steps on the phone. You know what yeah. I mean? Like, yeah. 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 And, uh, <laughs> and I'm like, oh, my God. <laughs> oh, shit. And and the other thing that stands out, that that was a good standout. But it was, uh, this other one wasn't a Steve Lukather standout. But when you mentioned Larry Klein and his rig with Joni Mitchell. So one time we were taking Larry Klein's rig to Dave Stewart's house, right? Where he had that uh, he had this studio that was like a church at the back of his property in a casino. Yeah. And uh, and there's this big long driveway that you had to, well, we thought back up. Right. So we're backing this truck up this driveway. This is pretty steep, you know. You're backing yeah. it up. Did you? That's, you can't there's see, only one way. Can you? And uh, halfway up, it went boom, and flames shot out the side of the truck. <laughs> so, so we have we have Larry, uh, Larry Klein's gear, Dan Huff's gear, yeah. and several other people on the truck in the back. It's going up in flames. And I'm like going, oh, shit. <laughs> Just coat down the driveway, and we get the fuck out and run. <laughs> It's just like the truck's on fucking fire. <laughs> and oh, so, no. so, you know, there's people from the studio running out with fire extinguishers and stuff. And, and, and I'm like, going, I'm not going fucking near this truck. <laughs> uh -uh. But I had to call Lon Cohen. Yeah. The manager, you know, at the time of Andy Browers. And I had to call yeah. him. And I, had, I had to go, yeah, so Lon, um, the truck sort of blew up. <laughs> what What do you mean it blew up? Well, it sort of exploded in flames on Dave Stewart's driveway. <laughs> and on the other end of the phone, you could hear Andy on the other end. What's going on? What's going on? What's going on? <laughs> and, and you know that they were fucking freaking out. Oh, that's perfect. <laughs> it was pretty, you know. It, everything, the gear was okay. The truck was okay. They put the fire out. It's okay, but, but, uh, you know, it was dead in the driveway. And then com along comes along Jamo, right? And uh, the bail and out. gear in Jamo's truck, and he takes it to the top of the street. And we still had to load it in for the session. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh man, uh, that was fun. <laughs> That's fun. That's funny. Yeah.
That was good stuff. So, uh, but yeah, Andy oh. Brown always a fun thing. Yeah, right. <laughs> so, so I actually have a question. And now that we're we're up to uh, Lou Cather, um, and this question is from uh, a big fan, uh, Michael Nielsen. Um, he wants to know: Can you please ask Bob about the development of the Saldano X eighty eight preamp X eighty eight R preamp? I should say. Uh, apparently, the the concept was Bob's. Uh, they were building it for Lou Cather, I think. Did they replace all of his amps with the Saldano preamp? Um, in a sense, okay. I'll, I'll, let's let, let me back up a little bit. We're talking to Luke now. Let yep. me just let me. I'll get to that. Sure. That's a, that's a, that's a good story, but I'll, I'll no definitely problem. get to that. That sounds so, good. So um, anyway, you got to meet Luke. Okay, this is Landau talking. And I go, okay. So Dick Gall calls. I get a, I got a call from Dick Gall. Um, uh, we'd like to, uh, uh, I, I work for Mr. Steve Lugather and I would, uh, uh, we would like to, um, we've heard great things about your equipment and we'd like to um, come talk to you about doing something for Mr. Lugather. Uh, okay, come on, you know, and uh, I'm, T totally into that. Now, I had a place. I, I, I was living in Santa Monica on 4th Street. And um, I worked out of a couple of rooms. And I had just finished Dan Huff's new rig that he just got. Now, Dan Huff was the new gun in town. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And he had them all scared. He had all those guys because he was a monster player. He's coming in from Nashville. And he's there's a new sheriff in town. <laughs> yeah, they yeah. hate. You. Oh man! So um, he comes to me. I build him this cool little rig. And um, when Lukather comes over, that's what I demo to Lukather. Dan Huff's new rig that he hadn't even seen yet. I demo Dan Huff's rig to Lukather. Mm -hmm. And he checks out, he flips out, he goes nuts. Yeah, I got to have this. And I'm, I'm flipping out too, because it's Steve Luther. And um, he goes, whatever you want. You know how he is. He's like, whatever you want, whatever you need. I'll, I'll, I'll send you how much money you need, whatever you need. I'll send you whatever you need. Call my accountant, blah, blah, blah. blah. You know, I'm fucking flipping out here, man. I'm just like, now I'm getting paid from an accountant. Mm -hmm. Not a guy coming over and writing me a check, you know. It's like yeah. now I'm getting into, ooh, this is getting to be big time now. I got, I got guys, accountants paying me or whatever. So, I, uh, I go, okay, great. Let's um, um, let's do, uh, let's do, uh, let's get this going. So, so um, we get it going, and I start building this thing for Luger there out of my house, um. Go over the course of a few months. This is uh, 84, mm -hmm. uh, 1980, summer of 84. And um, um, I get it all together. Big day comes. He sends Cartage to come pick it up. Now we're going back over to Leeds. And we're going to yeah, set it up in Leeds, right, next door in one of those rooms. Um, this is before, you know, I hooked up with Andy. Yeah, so best this, room ever. Yeah, it was, it was right oh, right there on Weddington. And so um, we, we, we load it all in, set it all up. Uh, Luke's, I think Luke hadn't shown up yet, but Dick's there. It's just me and Dick. And um, we load it all in, set it all up. Fired up, no sound, <laughs> no fucking sound. I'm like, wait a minute here. I'm just, I'm fucking now. I'm internally. I'm just flipping out. You know. I'm, you know. I'd come to. I'd come to know this feeling. You know, later in my career. Yeah. But this is kind of new. You know? Panic. Yeah. Total <laughs> panic. Luke walks in. Hey, man, he's all excited. Here's the ring. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Um, uh, and then Dick's, uh, I'm cowering behind the fucking rack, trying to figure out why there's no sound, thinking to myself, 
Fuck. Fuck. Landau's rig doesn't do this. What's going on? Landau's rig works. Shit. I don't know what the fuck's going on. I'm going, oh, I don't know. I, I, um, I don't know. He looks pacing around. I'll let you figure it out. He walks out. Didn't flip, flip out. You know, he didn't know what he was getting himself into. So uh, comes back in. No go. No fucking go. I couldn't figure this thing out. I didn't have tools or anything with me. Wasn't going to start tearing everything totally apart. Couldn't go in the box, you know, per se. Um, what, what should I bring tools for? It works great. Worked at the store. You know? yeah, yeah. So um, I go, uh, uh, well, I'm sorry. I got to take this home. Can't do this today. And um, he, uh, he goes, well, I, <laughs> I never forget this, man. He goes, well, I guess electricity is not your friend. <laughs> I just went, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I guess not. Not today, anyway. <laughs> so I go home with my tail between my legs, get it home, figure it out. I don't even remember what it was. I don't remember. It was something was... Only dumb, probably. Something something happened. Anyway, so we finally got it. Anyway, so now I've got Steve Luger there. And... Um, I get Luke. Uh, here comes, we get through um, summer of 84, early 85 now. Luke calls. Um, Dick's not working for me anymore. I go, uh, whoa, really? Why not? I go, well, he's just, <coughs> can't, you can't do it anymore. He's not doing it. He had some chemical issues or something like that, you know, whatever. And, um, I go, oh, he goes, I want, we're about to do a world tour for the isolation record. This is them coming off of Toto 4, winning all the Grammys. Mm -hmm. They right. took the time to um, uh, make the isolation record. It was two years after. They kind of took a long time. It was not smart, but anyway. Um, now they're going to go to Japan. They're going to start this world tour, the isolation tour. Luke calls. I want you to go with me, take care of my gear, because you built it. I can't do it without you, man. You have to, you you know, there's ultimatums with the guy. He's like, you have to do this. I'm like, <laughs> well, I got all these other jobs I'm working on, you know, I got other people, more guys. Again, it's mostly studio guys. Yeah. Um, wanting these rigs I'm doing. I go, well, fuck. Oh. Uh, I'll pay you anything you want. You know, yeah, right, sure. Well, you know that's not true, but it was sounded intriguing at the time. Coming from him, I couldn't refuse him, you know? I couldn't refuse that guy. Um, number one, it's working with Steve Lukather. Number two, it's a, another world tour back to Japan. I love that, you know, it was cool. Europe tour, everywhere, Australia, blah, blah, blah. Same thing I did with Joni. It was yeah. like, wow, this is amazing. Get to do this again. And um, I was totally into it. So, boom. Um, I, now I'm building, I'm working on guys' rigs all night long. Like, all through the fucking night. To tr because I'm leaving the next day to go to Japan. Or something like that. That's the mm -hmm. way my life became that. Mm -hmm. It became... Holy shit! Um, I got I got a deadline here. I gotta go do this tour. We're going out. We're going to Europe now. You know, uh, I'm literally working all night and then with no sleep, going to the airport to fly to Japan or Europe or something. It was like fucking brutal. But let me ask, like I said, let me ask, you, let me ask you a question. Let me interrupt uh -huh. you for a second. So. When you have to work overnight on a rig at that point, in time, I've done the same thing. And and then Cartage is supposed to come and pick this up, right? Oh, yeah. The it's next good. morning. They're supposed to be there the next morning. Isn't it inevitable that it's always the afternoon and not the fucking yeah. morning? <laughs> you're like, exactly. you're like, well, wait a minute. 
why the fuck did I stay up all night right. then? Oh, Could absolutely. Could have fucking finished it in like a reasonable time. <laughs> absolutely. And, and now I'm sitting there waiting for fucking you. Yeah. <laughs> I had guys come and sit with me. The guy I'm, yeah. you know, whose rig I'm working for yeah. is in there sitting there, you know, dicking around on guitar, you know, just sitting there. That's fucking the worst. Making noise, or, <laughs> you know, or doing That's something like, fuck, while I'm trying to fucking, you know, build this shit that I should have another week to do. I'm trying to do it overnight. <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Of course, you know, he'll break out a little something, a little uh, instant coffee, so to speak, you know. <laughs> keep things going. Oh, God. That was, yeah. Yeah. I remember waiting for cartage, motherfuckers. Holy yeah. shit. There, there was one time I did something for uh, Carl Bell. Mm. He used to play in Fuel. Yeah, and uh, and I I did something and there and, and I sent it off, and they weren't paying me because there was something he wanted to change or something on it. Oh, and they wow. weren't and, and they weren't paying me. And uh, I'm like, oh, you know, at that point in time, you know, you're working for your your your, your deal, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure. And you're working for your money. You finish it as per they wanted right and then oh, yeah. like, oh i'm gonna change something yeah you know i'm not gonna pay you till uh you know yeah, yeah. I, till i come back from this week or two of, of stuff oh yeah and, and then you can change it i'm in town for a day so maybe you can change it right so so i remember in the middle of the night sitting there changing this rig and i was there with a the guitar tech who was a friend of mine and at, halfway through it i'm like you know what Fuck this guy. I'm going to rip all these fucking cables out of the back of the rack and send the rack on. Right. You just go. <laughs> you go. Fuck you. And, um, and uh, I was just so pissed at that point. You don't and, fucking uh, pay and, me? And, yeah. and the text's like, no. <laughs> Please help. Yeah. Sure. Don't do that. But I was fucking so tempted <laughs> at the time. I was like, you know what? Fuck you. I don't need your fucking money. Fuck off. <laughs> yeah, yeah right. God, he had yeah. pissed me off at that time. I, that was the one time I remember that was just like, "Fuck you!" Oh God, I've I've undercut myself so many times, yep. so many times. I put way more time in than I got paid for. Yep, sure. so many times. It's sure. just, it's brutal. <laughs> I shortchanged myself. Yeah, fuck sure. myself because. They're never going to pay this. My labor rate is blah, blah, blah. They're never going to pay for this time. And, you know, sometimes they wouldn't. Right. Yeah. 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 No. So, yeah. Sometimes they would. Sorry for interrupting this. No, story. no, no. Please. That's great. Not Interjecting. Uh, All right, so, now, so now you're you're with Lou Cather. And you're... So now I'm with Lou Cather. And we're slugging around. <clears throat> uh, it, it evolves over time. This, this, this turns into a 25-year... Um, uh, relationship uh, and from 1985 the, the January of 85 until um, uh, Jeff Carl passed in 92 or 93 I think I think maybe 92 I did every show that Toto did and anything that Lukather did pretty much, you know, any show type things. I had to be there, you know, except yeah. for spud gigs. Or I, I'd probably be there just to watch, but, you know. No, I set those up, though. Yeah, I know. <laughs> yeah. I, a 4x12 on the ground next to the, the 20, 22 space All right, rack. and then a 4x12 on top of that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's like, wow. You're With really an H and H four hundred power amp beside. Yeah. <laughs> hey. So, so to answer your question, Mark, or the question, mm -hmm. I guess I should say. So we're lugging around at this point now. We're lugging around a big, you know, <clears throat> twenty odd space rack, um, and um, an amp rack with. Um, a um, a Soldano for lead uh, SLO 100 
a mar a modified Marshall for a crunch sound, and a long box boogie for a clean sound. All of these are mounted in a rack, um, huge big rack, box. weighs a fucking ton. Yeah, big, remember big that box. thing? Remember that a big big gray flag rack? I Those remember that one. Yeah. So we're um. So I'm going shit. This is good. and and you know they're not doing the business they had hoped they'd be doing. They had a pretty good they had good business in in Europe, but they weren't doing what they ended up doing and um, what they had done before. Mm -hmm. So we're hearing squawks from from management, you can't carry all this gear. You can't bring all this shit. You know, it's too heavy, blah, blah, blah. You can't blah, blah, blah. So I thought, okay. So I start thinking about this and I go, well, and, oh yeah, okay. And at this time we're using power amps now. This is, we had come up with the concept of, of um, putting dummy loads on the amps and eventually we went we realized, and I realized this working with Mike Landau, we came, we found out that um, loading an amp with a speaker, you know, it, 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 all this shit is like, it goes without saying these days, but back then we didn't know. I put, you know, um, static load resistors on mm -hmm. amps and um using those to load the signal down i got a good van halen story for you there too but uh, oh, I yeah, that's anyway um uh, we'll get there yeah we'll get there um we haven't <laughs> that's another um word of mouth thing anyway look at there um so we were actually we, we had realized that the dummy load static load resistors weren't so great anymore we needed a reactive load we would carry speakers in boxes that little were sealed up. Little yeah, plus. yeah, remember that? And we, yeah, and I have one Little still. fuzzy flag things, right? Mm -hmm. And um, we sealed them up, and and they'd be rumbling off in the corner, and you know uh, that created the load. So that shit's getting carried along with you know these huge amps and everything. So I go, well, okay. Um, we're really use, only using these amps as preamps. So how about I take one of my two rack space chassis and I, I want a, a preamp for each sound of those amps. I want a lead sound and I want separate gain, bass, middle, treble. I want a crunch sound. I want separate gain, bass, middle, treble. And I want uh, a really nice fender clean sound like the boogie was sort of giving us uh, mm -hmm. yeah, with bass, middle, and treble. All right, okay, who can I get to do this for me? Well, um, let's see. I wasn't going to do it. I'm busy building fucking rigs and stuff. I don't, I could, I could have done it. It would have taken me a lot of time, a lot of effort. Let's go to a guy that does this kind of shit, you know? I go to Mike Soldano. I say, Mike, I need a preamp. I'll give you the chassis. I'll cut the panel for you or whatever. Um, I need just that. I want your SLO 100 preamp in a box. I want a Marshall style, and I want a uh, um, Fender Twinish type thing. He goes, Okay. I didn't even tell Luke I was doing this. I didn't even tell him. I said, I figured oh, I'll spring it on him because if it doesn't work, doesn't turn out so well, I don't have his hopes up and blah, blah, blah. You know, I'm going right. to bum him out. Because he could, he could go from yay to fuck real easy. <laughs> you know? there, was, there wasn't a lot of in between back then. That's great. You know? So um, <laughs> he's much more, more mellower now, I think. But anyway. Yeah. Um, so I, he builds it and I get it and I try it out and it fucking sounded amazing. I thought it was great at the time. How long the time. did it take? Great. 
What's that? How, how, how long? How long did it, it take for it? Was, for uh, it, I don't know. It probably six weeks or so, something okay. like that. Six something, eight weeks. Nothing crazy. To build it. Yeah. Yeah. And um, I just said do it, and I forgot about it. And I I was cr- that's when I was crazy busy. But that this and this is what was it? Eighty eight. Right. Around, yeah, 87, 88. Yeah, it must have been because when yeah. I when I came working, he had that rig. Yeah, yeah. The, the, the three channel preamp and the H and H. Uh huh. Yeah. yeah. Um, I remember so, taking stairs several times. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so. Uh, Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, thank thank. Uh, Think HH for Christ's sakes, or, yeah, that's true. or VHT at that point. And, um, and but um, yeah, so no, those weren't even VHT power amps. That's a whole no, no. It was HH. It was the yeah. it was the V eight hundreds. Your that new pull down a preamp and and the uh, V eight hundred yeah. just heavy shit. Um, yeah. That rig sounded amazing. Yeah. It was pretty rad that one. Personally, personally, I think that was his, my favorite thing out of him. That that really? sound, that rig, yeah. that was amazing. Well, that was a good one. It was. Um, but later on, so oh, the the whole reasoning behind that HH was because of Van Halen. Yeah. Pretty much. That's where I uh, saw those amps for the first time. Yeah. Um, but. It was a MOSFET amp, and I thought MOSFETs might sound a little better. There weren't any tube power amps necessarily at the time, other than the Mesa Boogie M180s and 190s. It were mm-hmm. basically um, made for bass players, and um, they even for a time made them for home stereos and stuff. It was a pretty flat-sounding tube power amp, actually, that uh, we ended up tweaking and putting Marshall transformers in them and stuff and doing some other little things to um, get them more uh, guitar amp like they were fairly flat but still too anyway the um, the HHs were a flat power amp you could use those to power your studio monitors or something mm-hmm. I think um, Van Halen did at the time so um, they were flat and over time, we felt like that the the, um, the this this preamp needed some help uh, EQ wise because it needed it needed a um, a guitar amp power stage basically because there was but there weren't any power amp, there weren't VHTs yet there weren't any guitar amp voiced power amps at the time mm-hmm. but anyway I digress um, I show this preamp. To Steve, he loved it. We tour with it. We take it, and that becomes his sound. So, indeed, um, um, that preamp was born out of uh, a need for Steve Lukather, for sure. That's yes. the way. That's again, again, <laughs> as with all this sh- shit that I've done over the years, I'm sensing a need and trying to fulfill. Um, um, a need, you know, right. it's something to come along to solve a problem, basically. Yeah, you know? sure. Yeah. But, um, yeah, so t- to take that a step further, uh, Mike Soldano goes, ha, ah, this is a new uh, revenue stream. And he starts building X88Rs, the purple ones. Um, he's, you know, he starts making those things. And he charges eighteen hundred bucks for them, each one. And um, uh, I started putting those in a lot of rigs. Mm-hmm. I'm sure you did too. Mm-hmm. And um, he was selling them to me for seventeen hundred bucks. <laughs> <laughs> I, are you shitting me? Let's see. It was my concept in the first place. I brought the concept to you. I gave you the chassis to build the things in. Now you're building them, and you're only knocking a hundred bucks off them. And I'm supposed to, you know, do that. So, you know, 
I, by this time, this now this is stepping a little. This is, I guess they came out around 88 because he called it an X88R, right? Right. So right. It was right. in 1988 when they came out. Yeah. So 91, <clears throat> 90, 91, I had um, uh, struck up a friendship with John Sir. And John was still living in uh, New York, working for Rudy's Music, building guitars. But he's also got an interest in amps and all things amps. And he's he's getting he is bending Andy Marshall's ear, the um, THD guy. Yeah. You know, you know Andy. Yeah. He's, he <laughs> was. I think he was uh, uh, John's. Uh, amp mentor i think in a lot of ways he there's made, always someone what's that <laughs> there's always someone yeah i know right yep yeah so um i guess um um so so i, I in conversations i had with uh with john john had got a um i think he had got a soldano preamp maybe and he had got a switching system from me so that's how we developed our friendship and um, he was looking to ex expand more into doing amps and stuff. And he was tired of uh, building guitars for Rudy and not making much money when he was doing the building, you know, and uh, not making much money for his efforts. Um, and I said, buddy, come to California. <laughs> so, you know, um, I'll... I'll find you a place to live. I'll even give you a car. I had a little Toyota station wagon that uh, my girlfriend at the time, who was now my wife, uh, had. I said, we'll give you this car so you can get around. And we'll find you a place to live. He lived, I know it was an apartment right next door to our place. And um, he moved to California. Yeah. He loaded up the truck and moved to Beverly. <laughs> <laughs> so um and then we kicked around okay let's do a preamp that has all of the things that we felt the soldano was lacking you know we wanted some more aggressiveness we wanted um more life to it um kept the same format i didn't have any qualms whatsoever doing this because it was my concept in the first place Right. You know, it was my idea. So I'm going to do something. John was game. So we start planning that out. We go, okay, there's no uh, tube amp voice power amps, you know, that have like a, you know, or, or we were we were using, we were voicing the our preamp using a Marshall power stage, you know. So uh, John modified the Marshall, so we just got right in, added a tube buffer there to, to um, make it even better. And so that worked great. And that's how we voiced our preamp with a Marshall. So um, we wanted an additional EQ of some sort at the end of the chain you know, at, at the end of whatever channel you select to give it more life if you're using one of these flatter sounding power amps. So we added an active tube stage um, right out of the Radiotron designer's handbook of an active um, tube circuit that gave us a uh, boost and cut. It, this wasn't a filter. This wasn't a tree. This was a, an actual active tube stage EQ that had a um, uh, presence and low bass and a level control to trim it. And we had made that foot switchable as well so that you could add that into any <clears throat> channel to give yeah, so, some more life. So you know? it would kind of give you a depth and presence or whatever. Right, exactly. To a, a, yeah. a flat. Uh, yeah, a flat power amp wasn't giving you. Yeah. yeah. So then, subsequently, then you know, VHDs come along and they have depth and presence. And uh, you know, Mesa finally came out with a couple that were good. The Strategy 400 was a piece of shit. That was horrible. Um, the only one that they had was um, what was it? What was the two rack space one called, Dave? Uh, Remember? 290. 290. That's 
That was a good one. You used that a lot. You like that. Yeah, I like that one. Wow. Because, see, what we would do, we would compare. Um, I built a switcher that would switch the a power amp into the same cabinet and protect the one that wasn't being used. I had it on a foot switch. So I could go instantly back and forth, boom, 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 instantly switch a power amp into a, a Marshall cab fed by a preamp so I could compare. I could, I could yeah. uh, you know, uh, decide, you know, how close. And, man, the, the, the 290 worked pretty good. And then my other favorite was the 252 from VHT. That was a good one. That was pretty good. Yeah. Oh, yeah, that was good. 252 was great. Yeah, yeah. Can I ask you a question? That was my favorite. Um, yeah. Why didn't you guys ever make a power amp yourself? Here's why. Because one was already being made that we liked. Mm. There were already I, there wasn't any need to do that. that. As you know, Dave, it's a fucking chore to build amplifiers. <laughs> spec parts to 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 you know. VHT was right next door to me, to my shop. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It was right next door. So it's like, well, let him build those fucking things. <laughs> it was a pain in the ass. Back the iron, you know, get transformers. Yeah. That was a lot of money. You know, I wasn't, um, in spite of what people might think, you know, there's not a lot, it's not a, this game is not that, you know, Unless you're building stuff, if you're custom building stuff all the time, it's labor intensive as fuck. And on, in small batches, it's way more expensive for parts. You know that. You know, mm -hmm. you got to build a fucking shit ton of things where before um, uh, vendors will, you know, you know, even look at you pretty much. Yeah. So, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's tough. So, uh, yeah, VHT, we just felt like there was, already, was, there was already good stuff out there. Oh, and here's the other reason. Here's the other, another big reason was it's a lot easier to get a guy to change his preamp than it is to change his power amp because the change in preamp is so much greater mm. um, voicing-wise and tonally and all aspects of it. I, I maintain that... that um, the preamp, if you've got a preamp and power amp type configuration, the, 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 unless you're talking, you know, super low wattage power stages and stuff, the preamp's 80% of the tone, you know. Mm -hmm. um, the, you can switch out a power amp, and it's not as big a difference as switching out a preamp. Right. The voicing in the preamps and stuff will be much, sure. much great, you know. Sure. So to get somebody to, hey, here's our power, you know, you'd sell – You'd sell a few, you know, to all your guys, you know. Right. But then you want to still keep selling them, you know. That's that's a hard deal. Right. So we didn't bother. Yeah. We didn't think it was worth it. No, that makes sense. We just and you, know. you you guys realize you guys don't really realize. Uh, obviously, Bob knows, but uh, he could poke a fucking stick through the wall and hit hit Stevie in the head for VHD. That's right. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I mean, exactly. I mean, literally, it was the next unit over. That's yes. Um, yeah. And um, yeah, I ended up taking over that spot too. And, yeah. Oh, you, yeah. You you took off three at one three point. Three of them. Yeah. 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 And uh, and um, you know, it was an interesting time because um, that that era. That, so that's sort of when I started in in this business. You know, um, so this is when all these companies were born. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, this is when Soldano was born. This is when yep. VHT was born. Yep. This is Bogner walked in off the boat. Yep, he sure and did. And yep. uh, you know, and, and, and we brought this up on the show before, and it's like the reason I am friendly with all these guys is because I it literally I knew them all from when they were you know, when their companies were birthed. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yep. Literally. And this is the the dawn of the the great gear age that we're in now, so to speak. Yeah. Yep. Yep. And, you're right. Uh, and uh, you know, 
And and you and you started that whole thing, man, right from the beginning, that nineteen seventy eight or whatever that was started. Yeah. You know, that that was your contribution in the in the preamp. Yeah. I guess you'd say you were the originator of the preamp. Yeah. Or did Ace Boogie have a preamp before that? They might have had the I don't know if they quad? Had, did they have the quad yet? Maybe. I don't when know. did Bogner I always wondered this. When did Bogner come around? Bogner was, Bogner was He was doing was he doing amps? Because he had the the fish, right? The fish. Eighty, maybe that might have been eighty nine ish or something. Yeah. Somewhere. It in was there. right around the time we came out with with ours. The yeah, and there, was, there was, but, but but really the first preamp I ever saw. Well, I think a three channel thing was, like that was, was that one. Yeah. The black. Yeah. Yep. One. Yep. The prototype. Yeah. Where is that preamp? Japan, I think. Oh yeah. Yeah, I I think I. <laughs> I'm not so nostalgic it. about shit, man. I think I was buying my first house. I was looking for cash everywhere. I think I sold it for three grand. Yeah. Like, you know, yeah. that shit happens, man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Man. Right. You think you think about that? How many dumbbells came across your thing over the years? Uh, right. You know. Your, your your workbench over the years that maybe you could have bought, right? Yeah. <laughs> yep. 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 And sold now for one hundred fifty thousand dollars. I know, right? <laughs> Dang, crazy. So great. That's crazy. <laughs> so so tell us more about um your partnership with John. So with the John, well, I got John to move out to California, and um. He worked, he wanted to get the fuck out of building guitars. He was tired of building guitars. I'm not building another guitar. I'm never building a guitar again. Yeah, that didn't work. Um, <laughs> he worked with me. I gave him a bench. He worked out of my shop. And we had sort of a, he didn't, he worked with me. He didn't work for me, per se. He wasn't on my payroll or anything. But um, we worked together. He helped me with stuff. Um John was way into computers early on. He went through all kinds of trials and tribulations with computers in the, in the dawn of the computer age. Um, he's, yeah, he went through a lot of shit. He did a lot of work for me. He, um, I would come up with designs and lay out, a, a lay out for a circuit board, and he'd do the actual board and stuff. He did the, um, the 3 Plus. You know, he did that board. Um, we shared in that concept and that design and everything. He did a, a lot of it. Um, sp I helped spec the parts and, you know. But I was busy building rigs, man. I had to, you know, I needed help, you know. And then, you know, Rocktron comes along, and that was just a kind of a, ultimately a shitty <laughs> thing to do. <laughs> um, you know, um, but it, it helped at the time. It was good at the time. It, 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 I needed, I needed help, um, manufacturing stuff. It was like out of hand and, um, I didn't know how to go to a, um, bank and get a loan or anything. I think nobody would, I couldn't get anybody to help me there. Um, couldn't get a thought about patents and stuff but um but so rocktron comes along and they want to come out with a switching system I thought, oh okay that would be great because now i could just buy them from them and install them i i consider myself a systems designer first you know i created products to solve a need you know a need that i had you know, I wanted to make things easier for me and my clients, basically. So that's where a lot of the things I quote might have innovated, you know, came about was sensing a need for something and, and coming up with a solution. You know, that's right. basically what it was. It was it wasn't about making didn't make a lot of money doing that kind of shit, really, I because I, everything was custom built, you know, right. When I got help, it was it was good for me because um, I didn't have to manufacture them. I never wanted to be I never wanted to own a factory. 
So John comes to work for me. John's working for me. We start coming up with stuff, but we are both very, very like-minded, John and I. And we could never come up with a way to really push it forward. His, his brother was trying to help us. We went to different, we were trying to go to companies, get them to buy in and then manufacture stuff, you know, so mm. we didn't have to do it. Because I, I was against having a factory. I didn't want to be a factory shop foreman or anything, that kind of thing. I'm a, I, I like doing things the way I do it. If I have to build more than two thing, two, three things at a time, I'm bored, mm-hmm. you know? So yeah. I, that, that's not what I want to do. That's why all my systems are custom built. You know, they have building blocks that are the same. Um, but my systems are custom built. I decided way back that that's what I wanted to do after, um, shit like, um, that, uh, voodoo lab crap started coming around. I went, fuck this. They come out with shit that looks like a four by four, you know, I I decided, you know, four by four were my answer to a off the shelf type switching system. RS-10s came about because I wanted a simpler version of the uh, the RSB thing, the Rocktron thing. Rocktron mm-hmm. thing, I was grateful for the help, but it was too fucking complicated. Mm-hmm. It was too, th- those, those, those rack units had all that mixing shit on them, buttons and knobs and shit that I, I went, to myself i'm going fuck this isn't me this is i like the flexibility kind of it's not necessary um i i, I build an audio switcher that doesn't have a fucking knob on it i build a 20 channel mixer that's got two knobs on it mm-hmm. rs10 super simple mm-hmm. you know rl8 it's got leds on the front it's control functions simple you know um the Rocktron thing was just, geez, man, it's like crazy. And um, and ultimately, it didn't sound that good. Mm. You know, it's, um, it had problems. And um, it was just a, left a bad taste in my mouth. But I got a little bit of a reprieve, a little respite uh, from having to manufacture because I would pull those into systems. You know, in fact, the 4x4 was a, a a answer to being able to have front end stuff, passive stuff, um, or more passive type switching than the active stuff that was in the RSB thing. Mm-hmm. That was designed to be comp- the four by four was designed to complement the RSB system. Mm-hmm. Um, by using it, people were using multiple preamps by this point. So I would use that as the front end to the preamp inputs because it was more of a passive design. It was opto, you know, resistors and um, optos and H11. Yeah, H11s. Yeah, and therein lies the next evolution of the, the switching loops. Mm-hmm. I went from that um, to coming up with an opto circuit, you know, that work as a loop and at first they didn't i couldn't use all optos because they'd whoop Mm -hmm. when you when you um put a high gain pedal or a preamp in that loop the switching was slow no clicks but the switching was slow and that put the input and the output right on top of each other and oscillation boom whoop Mm -hmm. so you'd get those problems So I started using H11s, which were faster switching. And I put them, I didn't use them in the pass element. I used them on the the grounding element for the send and the return, because I figured any pedal you're putting in there, it's going to be solid state there anyway at that point. So Mm -hmm. what the fuck, you know, it's a drop in the bucket. There might be a little resistance. There might be maybe 100 ohms of resistance passing through an opto. I try to get it as low as possible, sometimes under 100 ohms. But, um, you know, from loop four in to uh, 
uh, or loop one in to loop fours out, if you measured, you'd measure about 400 ohms. And I figured yeah. that's a fucking drop in the bucket to what's hooked up to it anyway. You know, so I figured that's this hard wires. I, I don't mind that, you know, right. plus it's switches uh, quiet. And then I went to, you know, after that, that got crazy expensive. Because now I'm using opto resistors. I'm jumping around here, guys. Reel no. me in if you've got, you know, I'm kind of jumping around here. So then, then you jump to relays. I did jump to relays because then I didn't give a fuck anymore. <laughs> I went fucking, I went, you know, relays are easy. This is a piece of cake. And they work well. And they work well. There might be a little click once in a while, but so the fuck what? In the soup, it didn't matter. And it's it's transparent as could can be as long as you your your boards are laid out properly you don't use ground planes so you don't get capacitance between your audio you know right. um for a while i was using this is the my i think my best circuit my best loop circuit was the um two by four there was only like 50 of those ever made and they used um reed relays yeah and they had there was two of them per loop so the send was on one and the return was on the other. So there's distance between the loops. No whoops. Mm -hmm. And um, generally you could plug practically anything into them and they'd work, you know. But but then again, it, then it went to, you know, double pull, double throw relays. Because, yeah. like, fuck it, man. I can pack a lot of those on a board and they work. I've yet to have anybody really cry too much about a little click or a pop here and there and fuck any of those idiots trying to put you know mute circuits at the end of the chains and everything that that that's a that's a cop out too mm. i mean you're better off just to fucking deal with the fucking pop right because right. in the soup it doesn't matter when you're playing and you're playing live you don't hear it when you're when you're switching. You sure? I I would love a totally silent, you know, uh, mechanical uh, relay. It's a hard wire relay. Mm -hmm. Have you found anything yeah. that works? Do you use them in your amps to get around Rojas or anything? No, man, nothing works. No, <laughs> I know, right? Well, right. well, you know, well, there's there's that new new switching chip and stuff that's being used the matrix kind of chip that's being used in the boss stuff yeah. um actually works kind of cool works pretty well but uh, uh you know silicone what's it uh, made out of you know i don't even know what the hell it is to be honest it's it's it's, it's a virtual matrix chip so you can you know reroute right. stuff right. in different orders right um it works well and seems to be pretty transparent, but uh, at least in their products, I mean, I don't know. The little boss switcher it works well. Right. Yeah. It doesn't yeah. doesn't really color the sound. I mean, it, I was I was like, wow, this is pretty good. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Hey, Bob. You how, know, how, whatever. How are you doing on time, Bob? You all right? I'm fine. Okay. Good. I mean, we're going. <laughs> I told you this would be a no, no. A we're going go deep. This is awesome. <laughs> I love it, man. We're, we're good so, on time. So, okay. Go ahead, Dave. Let's let let's really in a little here. So, um, so you work with all these studio musicians, uh, Steve Blucher, blah blah blah, Mike Landau. Um, so then, when did it start getting into all the kind of eighties uh, rock guys? So like Warren yeah. D. Martini. And yeah, Steve Van, Stevens. Van and well, they're they're finding out about this shit a little bit, probably through Lukather, and you know, yeah, he, he you know he would he would mingle with these guys, you know, he was yeah. and, and and then through him, what really probably did it was Van Halen. I met uh -huh. Halen through uh, Lukather, you know, and um, that started that whole thing. And I so started, now wait now so you 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 started doing Van Halen's rig right when you were at Annie Brower's uh, place right? I was still in uh, Weddington, yes. Yep. Yeah. I was still in there. What year is this? <laughs> That's a story. Bringing him 
to the shop. He and Don Landy came to the shop one night. We had to go at night. And yeah, course, I think I heard about this. Of course, Andy <laughs> had to be there. And I have pictures with malt liquor in Eddie's hand. <laughs> <laughs> Andy. He wasn't invited to the party, but <laughs> he had to be there. But um, anyway, yeah. So yeah, so so Lukather, I get Van Halen through Lukather, and um, Van Halen was a good sport, you know. Um, I think I, I think I met him at a Nam show. That's where I actually met him for the first time. Me and Landau met him. And we were walking around, and, and don't, as you know, don't go to Nam with a rock star. <laughs> Bad fucking move, man. You don't get anywhere. <laughs> it was insane. And th this particular year, I'm I'm there with Lukather. He meets up with Van Halen. Mike actually got out of bed to go to a Nam show. <laughs> <laughs> we, we we went that year so Mike and I are walking we're, Mike and I are walking behind Lugather and and Van Halen which of course had a fucking mob scene surrounding them wherever they went <laughs> and it was just insane and you know Landau's not having this man it's just like this, this is ridiculous he can't stand <laughs> Nam or anything either. I, she's got about as much uh, fondness for it as I do. And so, um, yeah, that's where we met, and we set a time to come check out what I did at the time. And um, so, um, yeah, we met up at my shop. I showed him stuff. I think I might have even had to. I mean, I might have. Th these are times when I was so fucking busy, I never had a rig of my own. I was always showing off somebody else's rig I was built or was working on. Mm. I didn't have a demo rig. I just built them and then shipped them out, built another one, shipped it out. I never could find the time to build a demo system to demonstrate to people so i think we yeah. ended up demonstrating some aspects of andy's that i had built for him so that might have been why he was there too but um yeah so he got on board so and, so he um, got was he at this point this is a switching system that van halen got yep a little switcher i built him a load box for his amps and here's the funny story about that i built a load box um full of these giant static load resistors. And I originally wired it to be a four ohm load because that's what it I could do with the amount of resistors I had it worked out right to get enough um, uh, power uh, capacity I wanted. I wanted to be able to soak a hundred watt amp, you know, um, because the, the whole amp fed this thing, okay? So it had this sound to it. And when I showed it to Van Halen, he went, no, 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 it's supposed to be 16 ohms. It's gotta be 16 ohms. And I wasn't even, I'm like, what, really? I didn't realize at the time that a Marshall needed a, a, likes a 16 ohm load the best. You know, those are the top of transformers like 16 ohms. Okay, fine. I rewired the thing to uh, 16 ohms, you know. So I used like four of them or something for these um, four ohm resistors or whatever I did. I don't know. I, I got it to 16 ohms. So he's happy there. But it was still a static load. It wasn't a reactive load. I built this nice rig for Ed, but he's using this load box. And this load box could switch heads. I could, with a knob, one knob, I could, I could uh, a rotary knob, I could switch between like four or so different heads. One blew up, boop, switch to another one, and it'd be on the air immediately, you know. And he had these uh, flag racks full of dual 
Marshall um, head cases, but he had the one amp that he loved. And I don't know if it was the the, um, the that Plexi, that famous Plexi one or not. It might have been, but anyway, he was using an amp. Yeah, it could have been. Um, he's using it. He's using it in a, in a, in a static in a static load. It goes out on tour. He's using it. He uses it when he even using it when he was home. Um, that's what became part of his rig with me was this load box as well as, you know, the outboard gear, the H, uh, the STD 3000s, you know, and the harmonizer and the, the PCM 70 for the cathedral sound and whatever. And, a, you know, the other shit, the um, phaser and the flanger and whatever. So meanwhile, he's, I built this rig for him. He goes off and does his thing. Now I'm getting other rigs from other rocker dudes come along. Now that's where it really blew up. Mm. Was Luca there at first. God, I got all more studio guys and some rock guys because he was very well known. Van Halen gets on board through Lukather. It blows up again. And um, it, um, you know, starts going through the roof now. And I'm building other guys' rigs. Um, and, and by this time, Landau and I had come across the fact that um, Marshalls don't like static loads. We got to put a speaker on it. You know, what the fuck? A speaker? Why not use that speaker? Hello, mm -hmm. let it be the dry cabinet. Now, that begats wet, dry, wet, you know. Now mm -hmm. you got wet, dry, wet stuff because you got the dry center image you're using now. It's not just in a load box, reactive or not, a speaker or not that was buried. Now we're utilizing, you know, three speakers. Mm -hmm. now, yeah. Well, big confusion to sound guys everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> God, it was bad enough getting them to deal with a fucking boss chorus. You know what I mean? Pitch shift on one side, dry on the other. <laughs> right. That's what created the boss chorus sound, you know? So, um, <laughs> so, so now we, I've come to, I've come to this revelation that, fuck, the amp's got life now when it's got a speaker on it, when it, it's breathing, there's electro back EMF happening between the output transformer and the speakers. Mm -hmm. And we also started, um, playing around, you know, by having the single speaker, we tried it with a 412 Marshall cabinet. And we tried oh, it, and that God. was six, 16 ohms. And, but I mean, just just burying the 412 cabinet and listening out through, you know, two normal, you know, stereo speakers with a power amp of choice. Yeah. It was fucking, it's like, wait a minute now. A 16 ohm 412 cabinet sounded different than at a single 16 ohm speaker. They mm -hmm. were both 16 ohm loads, but I guess the complexity of all four speakers working somehow puts the mojo in there. You know, I never analyzed it, I just listened. You know, I used my ears. I just mm -hmm. said, okay, this sounds a little different, but what's practical? You know, so one day we've got Van, uh, Van Halen's, uh, they're rehearsing at Leeds back in the room three. Remember the big room in the back? Yeah, the great room. Yeah. And so there, this is funny. Um, I'm in there with Zeke. Remember Zeke Clark? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Zeke, I'm in there with Zeke and Ed one day. And he's got his rig in there and he's trying out a, I don't know. I don't know if it was anything new, but I had this revelation for him. I have Ed, check this out. Putting a speaker on it, not this load, but an actual speaker. The amp sounds more real. It sounds like a real amp now. Check it out. He listened to it. I don't like it. It doesn't sound <laughs> right. He had gotten so used to that load resistor sound. He didn't like the sound of a real speaker connected to his amp now through this rig. He thought, ah, it's weird because 
Maybe it's got to do with the wireless or something. I don't know, but it's just not right. It doesn't work right with the wireless. I'm like, <laughs> I'm like, what? I'm just like, I'm fucking crushed. I'm like, are you a fucking moron? What the fuck is going on? Here? What's going on here? You're kidding me. You like the sound of the, uh, to each his own. I go, okay, whatever. But finally he came around. He finally came around, and and uh, we ended up um, uh, adding that dry center speaker, and he went with the wet, dry, wet vibe, and he finally got that. Yeah. yeah. Now, another funny story. Uh, by this point, he's got a different rig that I built for him, much of the, much the same, but he was then using. I had come up with a device called an amp selector. It switched up to four amps into a single cabinet. This is a, a result of people wanting more sounds, like heads and stuff. But to do the wet, dry, wet thing, you know, and Ed was using that. He had his 5150 amp, his PV amp, and he wanted to switch to a Marshall with a crunch sound which slightly overdriven sound that the 5150 amp couldn't get in. So I hooked him up with an amp selector. And now we're on this quest to find a decent Marshall that gave him the crunch sound that he wanted. Okay. So we're in rehearsal, a place in Burbank. I forget where it was. Um, we're in this rehearsal room. Now the guys had loaded in all his gear, set it all up. And I've got this amp selector that he's using. And he's going, doesn't sound right. I go, what do you mean? Just it does it's not right. That thing doesn't sound I'm going, this is passive. There's no it's giant relays switching the output of your head into your cabinet. What uh, there's nothing what do you mean color what's colored? It sounds different. Doesn't sound right. Okay, what the fuck? <laughs> <laughs> uh, try some different cabinets. He got another set of cabinets up. Try some. Doesn't sound right. It's not right. It's, it's not right. Blah, blah, blah. <laughs> so sounds like him. <laughs> I know. I'm going, fuck. What the fuck? Okay. Uh, and, I, and then I think, if you have, did you happen to change the speakers in your cabinets recently? Some roadie guy, I don't know if it was Zeke or not, some roadie guy pipes up, yeah, we changed out all the speakers, we put new ones in. And I'm like, what the fuck, are you shitting me? <laughs> These cabinets have brand new speakers in them? Oh my God. Yeah, we put new speakers in, we didn't want them to blow, you know? Oh, fucking, are you shitting me? There was no time on these speakers. They hadn't been broken in. They had no time on them. They, they were out of the box, brand new speakers. No wonder it's not different. Put the old fucking speakers back in, please. Uh, so we put them in one cabinet. You have to, ah, there it is. He was fucking blaming my gear, for, <laughs> <laughs> which is the case. I'm used to that anyway. Anything, anytime anybody doesn't understand something, you know, and there was a lot to misunderstand in these systems I would build. You know, people, they'd go for it, but it was a black box to them. And I get that a lot. It's, it's you know, I get point, I get the finger point at me. More I always, times, you know. I always, at this point, when it's done, it's like you get a, a true bypass box for the whole fucking rig. Yeah. I mean, the whole fucking chain. And yeah. go... Can you hear the yep. fucking difference? Yep. There. Nope. <laughs> yep. All right. Go. No. Pay me. <laughs> yeah. That's so, great. That's just a couple of those funny stories. That's awesome. Hey, I know we're, uh, you know, we're running long. We have a, another question from, um, and I, I just remember it. I can't find it from the from the chat, but it was a question about how do you uh, use. Um, how do you go to two amps with one one pedal board, but go to two amps with their effects loops? 
Uh, the, the question was, uh, how, how do you run two amps with their effects loops with one stereo effect? Yeah. Isolate of, transformers. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly, Dave. Um, some elaborate switching uh, and isolation transformers. And the problem with that, too, is most isolation transformers that I'm aware of are generally um, have an impedance such that you can never be sure that what your output impedance of your fix loop send is on your amplifiers. Yeah. And if an amplifier has a relatively high output impedance send, it can be loaded by the transformers and um, they can affect the tone. So poor that's design. Tricky. Yeah, huh? poorly designed loops. Yeah, yeah, poorly or designed loops. loops. <laughs> yeah, yep, yep. What, gee, what's a dumbelator do? It fixes a passive loop, you know? Yeah, yeah exactly. Um, uh, yeah, that's that's the only and it takes some elaborate switching, mm -hmm. which I would rather avoid. Um, I try to keep things simpler, you know, so I tell and I say, pick the effects you want in each amp and do something different. You know, let one amp have different effects in the loop. So what? Yeah. You know, yeah. who cares? You're going to be you're gonna save so much grief, so much hookup, you know. This means you've got to send and return to each loop and have a common loop for it to, for the effects to be routed to and from. It's doable, but it's a lot of work. And, you know, it, uh, you're talking pedal boards. you got a lot of runs back and forth, you know, if it's not backed by the amps somehow, you know. Mm -hmm. So it's doable, but it takes effort. Cool. More questions? Yeah. Don't try to do it yourself. What's that? Don't try to do Don't it yourself. Don't try yourself, exactly. There's nobody Don't try that makes, it a, nobody that makes a, a box that'll do it. Or, well, some... Yeah. <laughs> so th this question is from um, also from Michael Nielsen. He wants to know, what is your favorite reverb, chorus, and delays? Oh, boy. Like which unit? You know, like a TC2290? Or... Of all time? Uh, yeah, of all time. Uh, just... um, oh, well, okay. It never I'll, stands I'll, out. I'll bite. Okay. Knowing Michael, knowing Michael, I know Michael. It would be of all time. <laughs> yeah. Um, I love PCM forty twos for a rack mount delay. I love Lexicon um, stuff, pretty much. You know. Yeah. Um, and same goes for reverb. Uh, lexicon reverbs are great. Um, if I were to pick and if I were to, you know, c considering everything, I like there's lots of stuff out there that's really, really good. Um, and it's better and better all the time. If you're talking about anything, uh, you, you'd have to qualify it more. Are you, are you talking in pedal format or are you talking in rack yeah. mount form? You know, another great, um, Rack mount delay is a Chandler. Uh, they call it a digital echo. Yeah, that was cool. Really good. Yeah. Really, really good warm uh, sound. SD3000. SDDs were great. I even liked the um, the uh, Yamaha D1500. Absolutely. Those are amazing. So are, good. I got a bunch a poor, of uh, They're definitely a poor man's lexicon. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, for pedal stuff these days... I appreciate the the Boss DD500. Yes, because it's got that SDE3000 patch in it. That's awesome. Uh huh. Yeah. <laughs> and guess what? Yeah. It's just here. You go. You don't need the manual. You just go. Oh, edit. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Here. That okay. One. I get it. I get it. I get it. <laughs> click, click, store. Great. Done. It works. Yeah. 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 Yeah, that's, that's a, a good one. That's a good Unla one. Unlike an Eventide uh, H9 where you're like, oh, yeah. Oh, how does this work? Yeah. <laughs> do I, I need an iPad for this? I need an iPad. Oh, do I have to sign on? Oh, wait. I'm not the user end user, though, so I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I do like the uh, time factors, though, for a good 
program. Yeah, those are good. Play. Those are good. They got those knobs good. on them. <laughs> yeah, right. That's I like true. knobs. Right. Yeah, the H9 Max I have, but that's you got to run it through your dude. Yeah. I I always like fucking cringe because <laughs> I'm like, oh, <laughs> I know. Wait. Wait, how do you change the MIDI channel again without the iPhone app? Okay, wait. And I have to look it up. Yeah. I'm like going, oh, yeah. Uh, oh, yeah, here. Right. I'm yeah. like going, I mean, it sounds it sounds good, but it's it's just like, fuck. I'm telling you, though, we get so used to all these cool pedal delays and everything that are out there. We do. We get used to that. We think they all sound really good. But... When you get a chance to plug in a PCM42, oh you yeah, no, fuck. Hear them, they, you just go, fuck, man, there it is. That's what I've been missing. Mm. You know, yeah. they just they have a great it's they have a great warm sound. It's old technology. Yeah. It's you know it's it sounds who so cares if it doesn't good. go out to 20k? You know, so who cares? Good. Right. It's like God, I'd roll it off anyway. You know. Yeah, uh, uh, I, I absolutely agree. It, it, it's not a forty-two. Is not just a delay. It's, um, it's almost three-dimensional. It's not. Well, like, yeah, because it's not like dot 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 dot. It's you, you hear this depth to the whole thing. It's almost like That's reverb. Right. And, and the, one of the reasons why is because you can modulate that delay line. You can. Move that to let's say you've got a delay that's 250 uh, milliseconds. You can move that thing up to 230 back down to, you know, uh, yeah, you know, just you can, you can make it swing between, you know, 10 milliseconds either way of the time that you've you've put into it. That's most delays these days don't do that. The, the delays out there, so many of them don't. Le luckily, the Korg SDD pedal did. Yeah, it was good. It did. Um, but I don't know of too many. What Strymons don't. I don't understand why not. I, I, you know, the mo most of the shit today seems... If you compare it to the stuff of uh, the Lexicons, the D1500s, the SDD, the SDE... If you compare it to any of that shit, it, generally speaking, just it that sh old stuff eats it. I know, right? Eats it yep. for lunch. Like, yep. You're just like, oh my god, why is that so much better? I know. Yeah, I God, I remember what? I, when was it? I was like, this is a few years ago before I moved here, which so it was over three years ago. I was, uh, I hadn't heard a PCM42 in a while. Yeah, and I was still downtown, and I got uh, Neil Giraldo's rig came in. I was getting his rig ready for a tour, and he had a couple of them in there. And I went, and I fired that fucking thing up, and I listened, and I went, "Holy shit!" Right there, it is, man. <laughs> there it is. That's what I've been missing. And, and you get fun. used to it, and you go, "All that stuff sounded great." You know, it sounded good. It's like. It's like getting a real good photocopy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know? A good photocopy looks pretty good. And yeah. then you compare it to the original, and you go, hmm, it's a little fuzzy. Not quite there. You know. Right. You know, one one standout, do uh, you ever play with one of those um, free the tone flight time delays? Yes, I have, yeah. Mm -hmm. The thing that looks like the 2290? Yes, yeah. Uh, 2290 is also a great mention. Pretty good, yeah. It sounded yeah. amazing. But that, that, that flight time delay, that has a lot of juicy qualities to it, like that yeah. old stuff. You know, mm -hmm. that, that, like, yeah. I was always like, ah, that that sounds kind of more yeah. like the old shit. Right, uh-huh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I don't know, yeah. You know, it seems like as much technology as we have now, you know, all the audio is lost. Yeah. All, all the, the, the it is. audio is gone. Yeah. You know. I had to... Um, I had to take, uh, as you know, speaking of 2290s, um, when I built Edge's latest rig, the one I built in 2015, um, we had to get away from the 2290s because they, um, you can't back them up. 
you know. Mm -hmm. And that guy had already plowed through all 99 presets, you know. So he had backups for backups. There was a bunch of them. And we were trying to scale the rig down and make it. Ding. So I went, OK, let's um, give me a fractal. Give me the ax effects. Let me go into that thing and strip it down to just they've got that patch mm -hmm. 2290 with mod. I go, okay, well, let me do this then. So I take and I hook up a, 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 the edges uh, uh, 2290. I hook that up and I go through every single patch and I'm listening to that and I'm A being. With a four by four and, and one switch going back and forth between a 2290 and that 2290 with mod patch in the fractal. And we're, we're, luckily, we're talking mono. It's simple. I put it into an AC30, just like he does, and I AB back and forth and back and forth every single 99 patches in his 2290. And I, I mimicked hmm. the 2290 in the fractal to where you couldn't fucking tell it was like dead nuts it was amazing then i took the um i knew this guy's going to be listening in on in ears so i gotta do something a little different here so i plugged in my ac30 into my old um marshall se100 those load box things yeah. I, plug, I plugged that in, put headphones into the load boxing, and then listened and and listened and A B back and forth and got the the repeats exactly the same and the modulation where it swept between the um the delay time, you know, to give the chorus thing, a little bit of chorus on it. And I matched the level. So now I've got a fractal that emulates a 2290. That's the only thing it was used for. Just to try, because it could be backed up. Mm -hmm. You could, you could, you could back it up to a computer. You could change the patches easy. Um, it was, it was a modern day 2290, basically, you know. And it, and it sounded dead nuts with headphones on to the 2290. So, did he like it? You know, that's one way of doing it. Loved it. It's amazing. That's cool. You know? Yeah. That's cool. Yep. Um, hey, we got a question for Dave. From Harmonicaster, he said patents on lace alumitone pickups expire in a year or so. Do you think others will make similar current transformer pickups? Uh, was the lace pickup that popular to begin with? <laughs> I, I don't know, man. Yeah, uh, I'm not that interested. Yeah, uh, I've never used them. Um, there was a question earlier, and I, 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 for some reason I've lost a lot of the previous chat, but there was a question about, uh, Bob, why you use Marshall 12s? Do you, remember, do you remember that, Dave? Do you remember seeing that question? Oh, because <laughs> they sounded good as a preamp. The lead 12. The lead 12 oh, yeah, yeah, man. The head. Not, not the combo, just the head. It made a ripping little preamp. And it sounded really good. And I put that in quite a few guys' rigs. I put Peter Frampton's rig, Andy Summers' rig, um, uh, uh, what's his name, uh, uh, Trevor Raven's rig with the S. Um, bunch of different people. That was. Those were great. Yeah. yeah. But that was the only one. The 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 comp So so what would happen is, I would buy them. They cost three hundred bucks, and I'd keep the cabinets. So, so I had a shit ton of those little single ten cabinets right. that line the, the the roof of my shop. You know, it made it made for a good look. But, I remember um, that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But um, yeah, I had tons of those for the longest time. But they that those little guys are a, still to this day a good um, crunchy little preamp. Hmm. And they work. That's cool. Yeah. It's um, like a big overdrive pedal. Yeah, exactly. Right. Yeah. yeah. 
Uh, we've got a question from Bent Rossum. He says, what is Dave and Bob's favorite separate two preamp and power amp? Well, you oh, know geez. my answer to that. Uh, your, your my combo would be a three plus with a, a, a VHD 252. That's uh, you know, I'd have to say the 252 also. And, uh, you know, the preamp is, I don't know, it depends on what you're looking for. That's true. Uh, you know, uh, I mean, I was involved in the Eggnator preamp early on. I mean, that was cool. I mean, at that, that time, at least. Um, the old Keith SLO. Keith still likes it. Huh? Who was that? Keith, Howland, Keith Howland still likes it. Yeah, yeah. He's still got the green one. The, the classic <laughs> green Um and, uh, you know, um, I mean, you know, even the Bogner had its merits, uh, you know, all those preamps. Oh, they do. I know. But, I, you know, I'm, I'm biased. Come on. Yeah. Of course. Of course. You bought you know, the preamp. <laughs> if, I, if there was a Friedman preamp in there, I'd go the Friedman, too. Why don't you build one, Dave? Yeah. Well, you do actually you have a I, I, You know, why don't I build one? You know what? I've been asked that a bunch of times in recent years, and I'm like, going, I don't know. I don't know. Is there a market? I know exactly. I don't. I don't make three pluses anymore. I, or I've yeah, suspended. Well. I'm not doing them now because right. it's just. And I get calls fairly often. You know, at least once a month from somebody. How can I get a preamp? I said, go on the used market. Yeah, you know, fine. Look around. I don't know. Is there guys in Europe so maybe, maybe they're starting to be a market again. I don't know. I don't know. Um, it's put an IR loader in it though. Yeah. yeah exactly. Exactly. Although look, you are making the preamps and the synergy, but that's not a rack. It's just yeah, 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 yeah. The preamp modules things and for synergy. Yep, yeah, yep. Yeah, we are yeah. doing that. Um, that thing works. It's awesome. Yeah. I, I've got it too. It's great. Do you use one of those, Bob? Yeah. I have not. No. Nope. Oh, you'd like it. It's good. Yeah. It's a good, useful tool. It's a yeah. cool. Yeah. It's like a highly idealized modular you know you know when randall had those and eggnetter had those right right kind of right. like but it's highly it's it it's an approved version shall we say okay yeah it's good yeah they sound killer um uh ben rossum says friedman two preamp uh hell yeah <laughs> there's one sale dave there you go there's one there's one <laughs> <laughs> could you multiply that by like a hundred thousand <laughs> That would be nice. Um, I'll tell you what. I'll tell you what, guys. I'll make one if you if you can if you can come up with fifty sales. Yeah, right. <laughs> if I can do fifty of them, you're in. I'm in. Yeah, I'll take one. But they all got to be sold before I start. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> At least a small deposit. Yeah. Not not a big deposit because I actually want to get paid in the end. <laughs> yeah. Right. Exactly. Yeah, there's got to be some incentive at the end, right? Yeah, yeah. Otherwise, it'd never get done. Right. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Never, never take money in advance. I've learned this over the years. <laughs> yeah, that's, yeah. I kind of stopped doing a lot of that. You know? Yeah, because, yeah, because otherwise you're just like, oh, yeah, I got to do that shit. Oh, yeah. But wait, I got this other thing that. Yeah. That's too funny. Yeah. That's so funny. Uh, Dylan Farrell has a question. Thanks for the super chat, by the way. Uh, I always listen to these, but haven't gotten to tune in live because I gig most Fridays. Wondering uh, when the twin sister will be shipping to dealers. That's going to be probably a little delay. Well, now let's let's just talk about that just for a quick yeah. moment. Yeah. Uh, so first, we have a delay with uh, just general parts. So now we have a delay with a complete shutdown of Los Angeles. <laughs> so. Yeah. Um, yeah, well, you know what? We will make them as soon as humanly possible, but uh, right now, I don't have an answer for you. Yeah, that's We're funny. shut down, man. Yeah. I saw, I saw the Saldanos are also on hold. Factory closed at the moment. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Man. Yeah. So, man. So, so everyone that works for us is out of work. Yeah, that's a bitch. That sucks. Yeah. Sorry. Man. man. Yeah, it's crazy. Uh, uh, let's see. Um, oh, so uh, someone said CAE head. Um, 
So that was a that I mean that was a great head also. Well, yeah. Well, that's another collaboration with John Sir. Right. And um, I ultimately I um, sold the rights to manufacture back to him. I'm not an amp builder, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, I had a place that built my preamps, which is why I who's built every single preamp ever made, built by the same um, company, same factory, every single one of them outside of the pre the, the prototype yeah but um yeah i that's not my game you know yeah but with john with john there we decided to do it because i had him there you know and so it was good and that's the other thing you gotta hmm. basically the shit that i do doesn't have a sound you know it shouldn't have a sound you know it's it's mm-hmm. the combination of the things is all connected it's, it's the um you know i build systems out of other people's gear basically i build the parts to make it all work together that's my concept my designs and such but what makes a sound is other manufacturers gear you know so for a time when we did the preamp, I my hat was in that game, you know. So because I say I this is the sound that I like, mm-hmm. maybe you'll like it too, you know. And that's what we did. But I had John there to do a lot of that uh, heavy lifting too. Gotcha. So um, yeah. Okay. Um... Brian S. and I know we're we're winding up, we're winding down with questions. We got a lot of, uh, we've gotten through a lot of them. Um, Brian says, before you wind this thing up, ask Dave for me the story of his P90s. I have one of his vintage tees. How much work was put into them? They are crunchier and quieter than others. Um, uh, well, it's a P90. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, uh, uh. I don't know if why they necessarily would be quieter than others. It's a large single coil. Um, how did we? You know what? It was like something like essentially like Grover wound wound one. I listened. I said no hotter, no dark, you know, or no less hot. Or we went back and forth a little bit, and then and then it was just like yeah, there it is, boom, done. So, uh, yeah, that was about all the thought that was in it. <laughs> so there there's go. no magic. It's 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 a traditional P90 style design. Um, mm-hmm. So, okay. um, yeah. So just uh, just just listen with my ears, and then you know find the tone. Gotcha. Um, another question for Bob, and this could also be for Dave. Uh, what was your biggest rack meltdown catastrophe you've ever had on a gig? That was from Michael also. Oh, I have a story. Okay. Go for it, Bob. Go for it. You want me to take it? Yeah. Yeah, go for it, because I can't think of one right now. Okay. It was a Toto show, and um, uh, shows, sound check is all cool. Everything's fine. Um, uh, show starts. Um, they're playing, um, I'm not sure if they got a few tunes in, I think they got a few tunes in, um, and all of a sudden, I think Luger was in the middle of a solo, (laughs) of all things, boom, pow, the fucking rig goes down, the whole thing, just, what the fuck, lights out. Suddenly, I'm looking at what the fuck? I'm going, holy shit, everything is off. I'm going, okay. Um, uh, it wasn't as power was down, the rig was down. It wasn't like, oh, okay, I can bypass around something, you know. So, you know, clock's ticking now. Now they're stopped. Now they're tell some jokes, you know, get them back up in a minute, blah, blah, blah. 
wasn't happening. Uh, pretty soon, a few minutes had gone by, and and the band realized that this isn't happening. Mm. So they go, we're gonna leave the stage while this gets sorted out, and we'll come back and play for y'all when they get back up and running. And I'm like, I'm thinking. Fucking holy shit! It's his rig that's gone down. It's it's a showstopper. At this point, I had never had a showstopper um, yet. Something that would stop a show like that. That's the first show. This is in a show in Long Beach, California, too. Hmm. Um, and I'm fucking flipping out. I'm going, what the fuck's going on? What the fuck's going? On? I start now. You got to realize this, this. These little racks that we had at the time. Still has, I guess. Um, jam packed, full. I mean, there was not you. There was stuff in the back too, you know. So I start unplugging things and start trying to figure out. Comes out, figure out there's no power. No power. <laughs> Turns out a fucking the uh, the Furman power conditioner had taken a shit and took out the rig. So now I've got to unplug everything that normally plugs into the top of a rack in a Furman, get a plug strip somehow up in there and get all of those plugs plugged into it. You know, <laughs> it's just it's just hanging in the back. It's just all fucked up. Finally, I get the thing back up, fire up the rig, go downstairs with my tail between my legs and say, you're back on, go. Go, oh, we got it. Oh, okay. All right. And then now, of course, they're kidding and chiding me and everything. But but no, no big, you know, nobody was too terribly pissed off. They get back up on stage and they launch into the fucking tune right where they left off. And he went right back into the solo, mm. mid solo, right where they had stopped. Where it gone. <laughs> that's, <laughs> like, that's so good. It's like, holy shit. Thank you. <laughs> but that's that's a, that's a, that's the biggest meltdown that i could think of show, off the top of my head that's for a me. showstopper and, yeah that's a big one yeah dave any for yeah. you i know you recently had I, with slash you know, something uh yeah but that wasn't yeah that wasn't you know the most the thing that comes to mind I mean, it wasn't the end of the world but um the thing that comes to mind is there was one year we're at a nam show exhibiting our products you know and uh, we're doing a, a NAM show, actually, a, a, you know, like a, a music show. Uh, and uh, Steve Stevens is doing it with kind of an all-star band. And he's got his signature amp. You know, it's pretty new at the time. And uh, uh, he's got uh, this great tech friend of mine who's really good. And, you know, he's taking care of him at the venue. I'm still at the show. And he calls me. He goes... Steve Zamp caught on fire. <laughs> I'm like, what do you mean? I mean up in smoke. <laughs> I'm like going, what the fuck? Uh, you know, like we're like, uh, uh, okay, we're going to take one from the show and run it over to you right now. Wow. You know, so I think my partner at the time, I'm like, take this, go now. <laughs> You know, because I was still stuck there for a minute. And uh, take it, go now. It literally had complete, the the power transformer in the amp had a defect in it. Oh. And it literally completely went up in smoke. Oh, I mean, God. it was just the nastiest smelling, worst, <laughs> and melted down transformer smell. And, you know, yep. oh boy. I'm like, I'm like, oh, what the fuck happened? <laughs> was it the power transformer? Yeah, yeah, it was. It was a defective power transformer. It was wow. nothing wrong with anything that we did in the amp or anything. It was just a defective transformer from the yeah. factory. It'll happen. Yeah. yeah. Just just a, a weird anomaly. But I I just remember that. What do you mean he caught on fire? <laughs> I mean he goes he goes, smoke was billowing out of the amp. <laughs> oh, wow. That's a nice tar. <laughs> yeah. That's yeah. awesome. Um, Dave, Brian Landreth wants to know, are you still doing mods on the Jet City 33 20-watt amps? Uh, sure, the 20-watt amp. Okay, you said you found... JC 20. 
Yeah, J J C thirty three twenty. That's what he said. Thirty three twenty. Well, I think it was J C A twenty. Okay. That particular model. Yeah, yeah, I can still do that for you. Sure. I haven't for a while, but yeah, I can. Right now, absolutely. Mods are open, people. Yeah. <laughs> I got a lot of time on my hands at the moment. Right. So last question, because I know this one can take a little bit of time, maybe a few minutes. What are your thoughts, Bob, on uh, – because you taught, you mentioned the Fractal and Axe Effects. What are your thoughts on the Kemper and stuff like that, these modeling things that are so popular these days? It's, uh, it's just another tool or expression. It's like um, – it's another wrench in the toolbox, basically. Right. You know, I think um, you can thank um, uh, exorbitant shipping fees for um, the proliferation of those type items, I think. Um, and this technology's gotten better, you know. Mm -hmm. um, the tech has gotten much better. But... Um, uh, that can know. be an amp in a PCM42. I don't know. Yeah, I know. <laughs> um, they're a wonderful thing. They're they 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 are they're 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 really cool. The technology is amazing for sure. But I find they're still very very limited. They're great within their own world, within what you can do with them, you know. But there's a guy down the street that's making a cool ass pedal that ain't going to be in there. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. There's so many people out there now. It's a world of all of this kind of stuff of, of sound. Mm -hmm. It's not going to be in there. You're not, you know, you're going to get a tube screamer model of something and, you know, whatever. I mean, the, the three plus preamp that they have in a fractal, that's, it's a, it's a, it's not even close. Right. It's not. It's not even close to a three plus, and they're calling it that. You know, I mean, but they're really cool. If you're in a wedding and you got to get your, you know, <laughs> shit to a, you know, to the gig, and you're, you're driving your your um your mini, it's a cool thing, and it's great for big shows. It's great for um, huge shows. Most of the shows that come through here. Through Rocklet, it's the the big um, uh, uh, programmed shows, so to speak. You know, are all using that stuff, and it's um, and that's great. It's 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 repeatable. You know, it's um, uh, flexible to an extent, but I fear that um, and it is it really it's the future. Let's, let's face it. Someday tubes are going to go away. Amps are going to, you know, I'll be long gone. Your world will all be long gone. Mm -hmm. And kids won't even know what a fucking Fender Deluxe sounds like or, a, you know, anything, you know, or a Marshall Plexi. What's that? You know, mm -hmm. they're going to be gone. They're, you're not going to or you're not going to be able to get tubes for them anymore. It's a real small market. This market that we're in yeah, so we talked about that a lot. you know it, it i think it's probably yeah it's the future do i like it i've i'm indifferent towards it i mean i i like i said it's a um it's a means to an end it's a um it's a pretty cool thing i guess you know mm -hmm. but um it's not stopping me from what i do i mean i incorporate them Right. I think some of the coolest rigs that I do are, are you know, ones that um, have both, you know, Hybrid. they'll have both of them in there right. and they can, they can work together, you know, yep. edge is edge is perfect example of that, you know, um, uh, Steph Carpenter with Deftones, that's another guy, you know, he uses both. Right. A lot of people do. Yeah, it's 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 very popular these days to use both. Yeah, so, yeah. So I think we've gone through all the questions. It's getting late. I, uh, Bob, I want to thank you so much for coming on the show. You, you're uh, you're welcome. You're awesome. Sure, guys. Uh, your stories are fantastic. Uh, you, you know, you're, you're 
you're a pioneer really in the industry um and uh just to have you and dave on the show it's like it's just like mind-blowing well it's fun to chat with you there dave you too, yeah Mark. man we haven't chatted in a long time no it's been a while yeah man that's very cool awesome i'll man. have to come out to a nam show someday and hang out yeah if we ever have a nam show again <laughs> <laughs> i hope do you ever do nashville you know, we did a couple years. Um, we did a couple years. Obviously, that this year is uh, all sh in the shitter now. Uh, so uh, I don't know. We'll see in the future. Yeah, I, I like I like doing the Nashville show because it's fun. It's I, fun. Uh, yeah, I went I last year. Nashville, hang out. Mm -hmm. yeah. I'll probably do that because my son lives there. One of my sons lives there. He's a dancer with Nashville Ballet, so. Oh, cool. Um, it's pretty cool. That's great. That's, awesome. That's great. Yeah. Well, you know that. Yeah. I know. I think I, I think at one point in time I contributed to his fund or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. So, when he was in uh, Boston. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's yeah. awesome. Now he's in Nashville. Yeah. That's awesome. Very cool. So, well, uh, super good. Bob, it was awesome having you on. Guys, check out Bob Bradshaw. And if you want to rig. So this will be on YouTube? Yeah. Yeah. All right. I'll send you the link. Yeah. I'll send you Bob, the link. Bob, do you have, you, have, you have any contact information that you want to put out there for people? It's Bob at customaudioelectronics.com. There you that go. Simple. That's it. I'll put it in if there. If you're in Lidditz, Pennsylvania, stop by Rock Lidditz. Awesome. You know, it's quite a place here. We will, uh, yeah. I'll put that in the, I'll put the, your, your contact information in the, in the, whatever memo stuff okay. that's on here and cool. uh so people can have that and um thank you so much bob just hang on there while uh while we finish up um before you hang up just to let you guys know we've got a couple other guests coming we've got trev wilkinson coming on saturday march 4th i think yeah saturday march 4th no march 4th am i in another april 4th yeah, I'm like in the wrong Don't month. Don't ask me. Yeah, yeah, I'm the wrong month. So Saturday, April wrong 4th. Month. And um, and then uh, Ryan Bruce Fluff is going to come on sometime uh, later in April also. So those yeah. are the two next guests that we've got. Um, and guys, check out Sweetwater.com. Also hit the subscribe button. Hit the like button. Thumbs up. And uh, you guys have a great weekend. Everybody be well. And uh, we'll talk to you soon. Take care.